Is it fixed? Look, Pablo. I feel like I'm not mic'd up, but they can still there's hear other, me. There's other mics on. But which one, then? Okay, we're going to go ahead and reconvene the meeting. It sounds like everything is working. Thank you, everybody, for your patience, especially everybody who's here, who, who's here to speak today. We have one withdrawn item today, and that's AO2, Recognition of Casper's Company, and that's from the Strategic Planning and Partnership. I need a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. I have a motion by member... Okay, I don't know if it's working up here. Okay, I have a motion by member Snively and a second by member Washington. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Let the re record reflect that all board members are present. We have one set of minutes to be approved today. That's October 18, 2022 school board meeting. I need a motion and a second to approve the minutes. I have a motion by member Gray and I have a second by member Washington. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Board members, I'd like to go over the format of today's meeting. As a reminder, we're a nonpartisan board who believe that all children can be empowered to learn to succeed, and our decisions will be made with that understanding. To pave the way for efficient and effective agenda statements and or questions, board members will have three minutes to speak with 30 seconds for final thoughts. Afterward, the superintendent can respond. If you have further questions, you're asked to get back into the queue. Member Washington will now go over the board guidelines. Thank you, Madam Chair. As we begin this afternoon meeting, let me quickly review the format of our school board meetings. Please silence all electronic devices. There are speakers in the room behind me that allow board members to hear the meeting upon stepping away from the dais. This meeting can be viewed with closed caption on live webcast, on cable TV, and on video monitors here in the auditorium. It also can be viewed with closed caption in the online video archives. Thank you, Member Washington. We have one item scheduled for time certain, and that's 6 o'clock. That's employee input. I will now move on to public comment. The board welcomes comments from citizens and values your input to the board. In order to provide the most comprehensive response to your comments, our staff will follow up with you and will keep our board informed about the responses. Our school board respects the public's right to speak to the board, and we appreciate you taking the time to be here. However, it is requested when you address the board, comments are not directly personally against the school board member or staff member, but rather directed at the issues. Any behavior intended to interrupt the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be allowed. Our civility policy is in place. When addressing the board, please state your name and speak clearly into the microphone. This afternoon, each speaker will have two minutes. Reminder that your two minutes start when you begin speaking. When there are 30 seconds left, you'll see a yellow light on the lectern. A red light on the chime will indicate when your time is up. I'll now call up the first five speakers. If you can please line up in the first speaker. I think we'll start with Ms. Jenkins. At the first five speakers, please line up. Hello, everybody. I didn't know it was my time. My name is Ann Jenkins. 
I reside 5023 North 39th Street. I'm retired from the United States Air Force after 21 years. Tampa is my home. I care about Tampa and I care about the children. The problem that I'm here for today, I want to talk about the NAACP and the, uh, the uh, resident that they have over on 40th Street. The uh, school board has given them free rent, no light bill, no water bill, no nothing. That's a problem. And the reason it's a problem is because the school board has tied their hands. If I wanted to come, go to the NAACP and fight about a problem that the school board is having, say I want to fight about the superintendent getting paid too much money. And I go to the school board, I go to NAACP and they can't help me because y'all letting them rent for free. That's not right. And it's something need to be done about it. There's so much, uh, you know, I got, I only had two minutes, but every week I'll be down here till I say everything that I got to say. But y'all need to look into that. Y'all need to get NAACP out of there because you all are tying their hands. If something happens with the school board, we can't do anything because they're afraid you're going to put them out of that school. Thank you very much. Next. Speaker. You're welcome. Good afternoon, my brothers and sisters. I'm here, my name is Twyla Johnson. I am the grandmother of David Rambus. He was brutally assaulted at the high school that he just now starting to go by another student. And thing why I'm here today is because of the action of your employees. They did not follow y'all school rules. We were not notified until my grandson came home brutally beat up. We had to take him to the emergency room. And when we tried to notify the authorities at the school, we were put off. We were not treated as human that I expected. Uh, the morals of the going down to the principal was not appropriate of y'all policies. It shouldn't take a grandmother to call constantly downtown to the school and the resource office at the sheriff's office as well, supervisors, to get something done about her grandson being assaulted like he was a grown man from another student. And this is his first year at Gaither High School. Thank you. Have a blessed day. And also, my daughter-in-law is here to finish the story. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, members. My name is Seira Betanzos. I am the mother of David Ramos, as my mother-in-law said. Bullying and harassment and how the schools are handling the situation, it hasn't been appropriate. The school board has written policies against bullying and harassment per the Hillsborough County Public School Manual 55-1701. The school board is committed to provide an educational setting and is safe, secure, and free from bullying and harassment for all students and employees. The board will not tolerate. Well, the consequences should be suspension or expulsion. Um, on October 17, my son was brutally attacked by another student in the classroom. If this, if it had not been by another student who intervened, my son would have had more serious injuries. The incident could have been prevented if there has, if there has been I'm sorry, I'm emotional. If there has been a teacher in the classroom. 
um, the bully started with a threat to his friend. My son stood up to those threats. Therefore, the girl said that she was going to have my son being beat up by her boyfriend. My son received a hard punch to the left of the side of his head, knocking him down and fell to the ground. In 2002, Seacoast High School, 18-year-old Christopher Fannin, one punch to the right side of his head, killed him. 1998, University of High School Orlando, Mark Thurston, fatally injured by one punch to the side of his head. I am grateful my son is alive. How many more deaths in the school? The board is waiting to do something about this. The school never notified me. They never called me in as of right now. I'm still waiting a call from the principal. And I work for an attorney's office and. Thank you, thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Josephine Amato. Um, I have a long list of things that I'd like to address the board about to include unequal access to free and appropriate public education for our students of color that's systemic in our uh, district and um, us not following our policy. But today, I'm gonna give you a break. <laughs> today, I'm actually here to honor school board member, Melissa Snively. I am a resident in her area of schools. We are East and South County. We are have one of the largest number of Title I schools, largest land masses, largest population, and all of our schools are busting at the seams. I am honored to know school board member Melissa Snively for over eight years, not just as a school board member, but as a daughter, as a mother, as a friend, as a wife, and as a successful businesswoman. And there's a lot of things a lot of people do not know about school board member Melissa Snively, and one of them is for the entirety up until the school shut down for COVID, she had a monthly meeting open to the public in her area where anyone in the community could approach her and ask her anything. She stood up many times alone, completely alone, but she stood up for the safety of our children. She stood up against eliminating equal access to the free and appropriate public education for school buses, because a public bus to public school over public roads fully funded by public dollars should be available to all students. And she stood up when our school bus stops are dangerous. She stood up to keep our schools open. And many times she just stood up for East and South County who's underrepresented and we have the population, but we do not have this equal voice. And she's done that alone. And she's remembered that she represents us, that she represents the people. She's not speaking for herself, but for the people and for the Republic. And a lot of people do not know her family's long history of service to the nation. Thank you, school board member Snively. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. I too would like to address bullying. My niece has been bullied and in my opinion still being bullied because she's out of school because of the incident. Um, on October 19th, she was attacked in the office during a mediation. Sir, uh, mediation. Um, she too had to go get checked out and everything and she's been out of school. The attacker is back in school, I believe. Um, my niece is uh, in the collegiate program, has a 3.9 unweighted GPA, 5.2 weighted GPA, and she has to leave her school and be dual enrolled in two schools, um, and the other person still in school. But I, um, her other option would be to leave the collegiate program, receive the Fs and leave that program, uh, go to another school where transportation is not provided, not fair, once again. Uh, and she, my niece is very, she was active. She's involved in the school. She's been a cheerleader, has a, a, a youth, working in the youth empowerment group. Um, she has a desire to become a pilot in the um, Air Force. And, um, her, and really and truly nothing has happened um, to satisfy the situation. Again, to me, she's still being bullied because she's out of school. She's missed, uh, I think, almost two weeks of school now because she's displaced. She can't go where she's been bullying and 
continued to be bullied because the bullier is in the collegiate program as well, and she's there. She can still continue her program there. My niece, who has done no wrong, but reported incident after incidents where nothing uh, justifiable has been done. So I say in a time when we're having so many kids bullied and deaths because of it, we have to do something. And I just want this to be brought to the attention that we understand there has to be a stopping point for thank, bullying. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stacy Mallon. I'm an English teacher here in the district, and I hold master's degrees in teaching ESOL and educational leadership. And I'm here today to provide some suggestions that we could implement right now to show teachers so much deserved respect. First, do you know what ultimately convinced me to work at Plant? Not the South Tampa location or the AP classes, though they were enticing but the main office. I liked how the administration engaged with the teachers and despite how busy they were, how the office staff continu continuously remained professional, courteous, and responsible. First impressions matter. In contrast, my first encounter with the district was a day of processing. Processing is a term prisons use to book new inmates. This is a term that neither demonstrates courtesy nor respect. Language matters. Consider changing the name of the full processing experience to something more modern, such as onboarding or orientation. Now, on to some more urgent matters. As teachers, we serve as role models for the students and teach them to self-advocate and speak up when something can be done better. As such, I request that you award our steps that we have already earned. I'm requesting, I'm not asking, because what kind of message would we be sending to students if we are content with only receiving the bare minimum and begging for what we have already earned? And as the union said, steps are feasible. Okay. Finally, please consider or decide whether you view teachers as salaried employees or as hourly employees and share with us. It's confusing. We are told we are salaried, but if we leave 30 minutes early, our pay is docked. That's not how salaried jobs work. If, in fact, we are hourly, we should be paid our hourly rate for covering classes or attending trainings, not $15 an hour. Thank which, you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Yep. You can come back at six. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. And if the next five speakers will line up, please. Good evening, I'm Marie Masser. I'm the Library Media Specialist at McFarland Park Elementary. I'm actually here tonight to say thank you. I'd like to say a thank you to the board and to the district leadership. Um, I know you've heard a lot about books and everything going around, but I want to say a thank you for supporting the children in our schools so that all of our books have windows, mirrors, and doors through which they see themselves. We truly are living in a renaissance of children's literature and, and young adult fiction. I, re I wanted to take a moment to show you this book. And it, it came home to me when a six-year-old, after having a discussion with Matt De La Pena at USF, he said they specifically said they picked no gender and no ethnicity when they drew this picture. Six years old at Carter G. Woodson, she stood up and she said, that's me. <laughs> and she was so happy about it. And um, I'd read about it, I'd thought about it, I had, taught and preached that, but that was the time it came home to me. And for me, this is the book. I'm not going to take the time to read an excerpt, but I believe everyone should read this book, um, especially when my students laughed at it. Star fishing is what this character does to spread out, because as you can see, I was not a normal size in school. And this book is my story, except for the evil mother in it. <laughs> so books are pictures for our children. And yes, life is difficult. Life is messy, and not every book is for every child, but thank you for that. And I just want to offer one more scenario. Just last month, someone said to me, when I offered The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, they said it's too Christian. So when we start to attack and pull books, consider the other. We could have those books that we consider to be most important to us to be pulled, and as a devout Catholic, that is my position. 
But as a media specialist, my job is to provide books for every child in every walk of life and every experience. So thank you for bringing books to our children that bring peace to our classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Greetings, Superintendent Davis and school board. I am Deborah Brown, and I'm here to this evening to stand in solidarity with my younger cousin, Tanaya, who has been a, a victim of bullying for over 18 months now. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of the timeline and some of the background information, and someone else will continue. On October the 19th, Tanaya was called for a mediation with bully by a school uh, staff member. She was called in because she decided she did not want to be friends with the bully anymore because of her bullying. Following what appeared to be a successful mediation, she was attacked from behind while attempting to exit the school's office. Um, the bully attacked her verbally and assaulted her physically. Around 4 p.m., her mom received um, the notification and she stated, I want to press charges. Someone at the school, um, made a report and the report stated student was a victim of a physical attack when attempting to walk away from mediation parent has given us permission to speak with her husband who is not on her card i let the family know the deputy will be following up as they are wanting to press charges end quote the bully was suspended for 10 days and the victim um, went to receive medical attention on the 20th her mom calls the resource officer to press charges next um, she fills out a bullying report online and then heads to the school board. Investigation is launched after the mom leaves. Around 4 p.m., she received another call from the school and notified her that her daughter would now be suspended for three days. This was after the fact. Anyways, spoke to mom and let her know that we got more details about yesterday's incident and that the, te the teacher, stating that Tanaya, turned around and began arguing back and then started fighting. No, this was different from the previous day's report. Mom is understandably both upset and with the conflict and statements. On the 21st, mom returns. Thank you. Anyway, thank you for thank your time. You. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Good evening, good, um, school board members. Uh, my name is Kathy Hare. I'm one of the community leaders here in Tampa Bay area, and I'm speaking on the behalf of the bullying also for Tanel. Um, as of now, Tanel has missed 13 days of the Curly program and has missed out almost a month's worth of work. Why it is that Consult been suspended for 10 days, have also charged presses on her and remain in the collision program. And one of the things that we want to express is that even though that she is an honor student that has been pressing on, I've been knowing her since she has been a child. Um, always, one of the things that we see now with children, they don't say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, or yes, sir, and no. One of the things I noticed about her, she always says that. She always addresses people in a polite way. And so for her to be into this situation of being bullied and also have to go to two schools now and also position and then also put her mother in a position where she has to find transportation for her daughter that was bullied is not a good point and a good feel on her reputation as well. So with her having sleepless nights and also dealing with mental illness as well with this. So as far as being bullied, it's something that needs to be addressed. And this is not just her, but other students as well that needs to be addressed. And that's why we cannot be quiet about this situation. We need to be heard and we need to allow you to know what's going on at Armwood. And also another thing too is that with her being here, it lets her know that we're not just gonna be quiet, that we're gonna stand up for her rights and that she know that she don't have to be quiet and she can push forward to what needs to be taken care of. So I wanna thank each and every one of y'all for listening to us today and making sure that bulliness must stop now. Thank you, thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Hello, uh, my name is Joe Denica. Uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, be here today and address each of you on this board and this administration. Um, I'm here today in the capacity of both a spouse, but also to stand as a role model for my girls, six and nine years old. By now, each of you are aware of who my wife is and what her role is in this district. She has addressed this board many times on topics of contract negotiations, security concerns for her school, and many other topics. She's a teacher, if you don't know. 
She is someone that speaks up and advocates for, without selfish intentions for her colleagues and for our children. As a husband, she makes me proud. As an individual uh, to this community, I have the utmost respect for her, by, my bias aside. I'm not here to praise my wife contrary to how as, as it may seem. She is just one of many that does the same in this district as her. I'd like to paint a picture for each of you to put in the back of your minds. Think back to when your kids began to dream of their future. They were going to tell you what they wanted to be when they grew up. Maybe not your own children, maybe the ones that you have mentored and helped succeed in their futures. Now, put yourselves in the shoes of that child in today's current setting that you all manage. That child says they want to be like you and follow that dream. They want to teach and inspire others. They want to grow the minds of, and the dreams of the tomorrow's youth that they are in there now. Would you let them follow that dream? Now put, time and again, employees have come here begging to be heard. I've seen it. To date, no gratitude or validation in the career of these parents, mentors, or role models that work in this district have come to fruition. You ask for more when there is nothing left to give. I see it firsthand. I'm not here to badger you. Like my wife, I come with solutions. The solution is simple. Thank Show you. your employees that they are respected. Thank you so much. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daryl Sanders. I am the mother of Tanaya Glenn, the one who has been bullied for 18 months to no avail. I want to speak to the TPD. Uh, this happened in the Sheriff's District, but TPD came to my home and they asked me, was I okay? And I began to cry because I'm not okay. But I, them asking me that to show that they cared. Uh, Tanaya, we lost my mother on August 8th this year. My uncle the next month, two kids committed suicide that we knew of. Uh, we're not okay. And so now they asked Tanaya, they separated us, this police, and they said, um, what's going on? She said, I don't want to tell my mother anything bad because she's going through too much already. On top of that, I began to email everyone to no avail. Only one person reached back out to me. So I want to thank TPD first for coming into my home, making us feel safe, and letting us know that you care that my daughter was beat down in a mediation where she should have been protected. You knew the girl was bullying her for 18 months. You should have had someone else there to protect my daughter, but you didn't. The lack of concern that Armour has, uh, no one has called me. I didn't get a call from the principal until Friday after coming to this office two times, <laughs> Thursday and Friday. The emergency room visit, you all have not heard of Tanaya's injuries. Tanaya had a forehead laceration, concussion, neck pain, back pain. Her ring left finger will never grow again. The nail is gone. I've gone everywhere like the, uh, the young lady said, the first speaker. I've gone to the NAACP to no avail. I'm not being helped here. So what I ask you all right now, imagine this being your child. You wouldn't stand for it. My last 30 seconds, I want to talk about transportation. Tanaya is going to two schools now. She'll be at SPOTO for her tactical, her traditional courses, and she'll take her HCC courses at Arnwood. I have to provide transportation. You give her a HOPE scholarship, no transportation. Me and her father, D'Angelo Sanders, uh, we have to go to work 4 a.m. in the morning. How are we supposed to get her there? The last seven seconds, please show that you care about my daughter. Tonight is here, 5.2 GPA, 3.9 unweighted. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. The next five speakers will please line up. Good evening, my name is Noreen Copeland Miller and I live at 1911 East Chelsea Street in Hillsborough County. I'm here to speak about the way that I was treated at Gary um, School at the building where the NAACP is housed. And I want to be very clear, I'm not here to talk about the NAACP, I'm here to talk about the leadership. Yvette Lewis, the president, would not allow us me and my friend that went out there for a general membership meeting on October the 20th to enter the building. And we had, and I have a disability that's visible and my friend was 88 years old. And after we came from the parking lot, which is quite a distance, 
and asked to just come in. They was like, we were not allowed to come in. And I did request a chair so we could at least rest before we go back. And this man, uh, Reverend Maurice Wilson, yelled that, no, you can't come in. And then he said a few words that made me feel very uncomfortable. And so I looked at my friend that's 88 years old, and I know we didn't need that kind of stress. I'm here today to ask you, are they allowed to not let, I'm a member, a life member, civil life member, and my friend was a member of 32 years life membership. Being a member or not, we were at a public building owned by the school district, not allowed in, felt threatened. Is that right? I mean, I've been a member of the NAACP for many years. On October the 20th, my civil rights were violated at Gary Elementary and my voter suppression, as we talk about a civil rights organization that is supposed to be leading the charge, this is not happening. I plead with you all to investigate the NAACP at Gary because they're not doing civil rights work. Please do that, and the public is not allowed in the building unless Miss Yvette Lewis select you to come in and it's run by five okay. people. Please help much. us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. I'm Bishop Michelle B. Patty. I think you all have my hand out. I stand before you with a heavy heart this evening, and I want to make it very clear. I'm not here to talk about the organization of the NAACP, but the current leadership, the bully, Yvette Lewis. We're talking about the Uhuru, Connie Burton. We're talking about Selena Ward, who acted as the secretary. And also, uh, there was a gentleman, I think they say he works for your school system, Mr. Ernest Woods, who was in that meeting when we attended, attempted to attend a public meeting at Gary Adult School. Here you see on October the 10th, the national uh, organization sent down a memo. It stated clearly five different times that we were supposed to be allowed to be a part of this of a public meeting and that was not done here you see go to the next page these are people there many of them are right here behind me they were out here in the cold we had children that was out in the cold and then your officers Tampa PD security had to come out to this place Gary Adult School, where they should have been patrolling other places, a waste of resources. And y'all are letting people, other people other than members of the NAACP use the facility. This Saturday coming on the website of the FRRC, they're going to be holding another local meeting for returning felons. We all support felons, but we need to know who's vetting the felons to see if there's any sexual predators on that property. But according to your MOA, it says clearly that no one uh, in set, uh, sublease number eight, no organization does not have the right to sub sublease or allow any organization or person uh, on any portion of this agreement. It also said there should be no discrimination taking place out there. It was taking place. There need to be a clear investigation of what's going on out there. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Bergeron. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Link Systems International. We're headquartered here in Tampa. We were incorporated in Florida in 1996. And we offer a service called NetTutor, online tutoring. And we have a platform called Pisces for online tutoring. I'm here today to make a statement in reference to an item on today's agenda, which is Subject 1.03, the Sole Source Award to Paper Education Company. Um, we had concerns about the sole source process. We expressed those concerns during the opportunity to outline our protest to the sole source. And we feel that we successfully addressed each item on the original source source, and that protest was denied. Um, we're not the only online tutoring provider, and, uh, and we're probably one of the longest providers, but there are other well-known online tutoring providers that could have participated in a fair procurement process. So the only thing that we could do when the intent to award was published, which had new information on it that was not provided to us to protest in the first place, 
which had content on it that's not related to online tutoring. They talked about games and trophies, and we understand that incenting students to seek help is important, but that wasn't the reason that they were awarded, um, although it was listed on the intent to award. So we were only given one option, which was to sue Hillsborough County for the right to protest the intent to award, and we didn't want to sue our hometown. So I just wanted to share with you that by bypassing that competitive process, we feel certain we would have served the students in our community even better. We would have had more local Tampa-based representation. Our services would have benefited Hillsborough County by creating jobs. And, you know, they, the, the paper service provides chat and text, but we also have whiteboard and audio and video and screen sharing. And anyway, the fair and competitive process Thank you. wasn't met. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Terry Cisco, Chamberlain Legacy Alliance. Every organization has a self-esteem, a self-concept, whether it's a country, a business, a school, a family, has a self-concept. I am here tonight to thank you guys for helping raise the self-concept of Chamberlain at its feeder pattern school, specifically Chris Fark is sitting here. We, uh, we had our homecoming Friday night and rededicated the field to the Adcock and Turner families who came and took the field. Uh, I had no clue how this was going to happen because it didn't look like anything was going to be ready. This man made it happen. And uh, the new lighting system that we have in the stadium will put, uh, will make any D2 college jealous. That school, by the time Mr. Farkas gets done and uh, partnering with us, that school is going to be the best looking school in Hillsborough County, mark my words. It's also going to become your success story, mark my words on that one too. Uh, we are going to make it happen. I just had a, a woman walk up to me at church on Sunday. She's been watching our social media. She handed me a check for $5,000. This is what's happening in our community. Everybody wants to be a part of success. Success breeds success. And uh, this, this group right here, they have been tremendous partners with us. So I want to thank you and I want to thank them. The, the second part of it is, Last time I was here, I talked about Adams Middle School. I know that you've got some decisions coming up that you have to make uh, concerning boundaries and, and so on and so forth. I would like to offer to you to host an all-hands-on-deck meeting at Chamberlain's Outback. And let's start a conversation of what Adams could look like if we reimagined we've got a building. We know this. We've got kids. We know that. We've got kids that need an education. We know that. So I want to offer to you, I know, um, uh, thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Next speaker, thank you. Hello. My name is Danielle Eichmann, and I'm from Carrowood Elementary, along with some other Carrowood K-8 Initiative Committee members. We are here again to speak with you about the importance of transitioning Carrollwood to a K-8 for the next school year. We would like to remind you why it's imperative to keep K-8 on the forefront of your minds. Transitioning to a K-8 not only provides stability for the students, including better mental and social health, but it also is so desperately needed in our community. As you are aware, school choice has opened and families at Carrollwood are absolutely feeling the stress about choosing a middle school, as there is not a single student that we are aware of that is planning to attend our zoned middle school at this time. Carrollwood families are again facing the decision to either move out of the district, prepare to acquire the soaring costs of private school tuition, or get ready to spend countless hours in the car driving. This can be avoided with transitioning Carrollwood to a K-8. We have shared that the Carrollwood community is strong and that we take great pride in being a part of it. Our Carrollwood students deserve to stay together and maintain the connections that they've made for the last eight, six years and not scatter. We recognize that a lot of effort and out of the box thinking is needed for this transition to be successful. But we are excited to step up to this challenge with your support and make it happen for the next school year. 2003-2024 school year. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Hi, my name is Krista Mills, and I am glad to be back here again today. Um, I want to start off by saying thank you for the board members who we have spoken with, who we've, meet, we've met with. Um, we know your time is valuable, and we appreciate your guidance in helping us advocate for our kids. I'm here to remind you of the nuts and the bolts of our plan to transition Carrollwood to K-8. Like Danielle mentioned, transitioning Carrollwood will take effort, but we know that it can be done with little to no cost to the district. Our plan calls for balancing the number of students in the school by limiting the number of incoming choice seats in grades K through 5. Those seats will become reallocated to grades 6 through 8. With the addition of one grade level at a time, this will allow the district to modify choice slots to give priority to our Carrollwood rising 6th grade students. This does not impact the students who are already choiced in, but it would just limit the future choice enrollments. Our goal is a class size of 110 students per grade. At this size, the FTE funding provided will support the teachers and materials at our site. We are not asking for any additional buildings. Carrollwood has enough room to make this happen immediately without affecting the school capacity. As seen with Maniscalco, transitioning to a K-8 can be done with very little additional funding by using resources that are available within the district. The transition is a win for the district, it is a win for our community, and it's a win for our school. We will be able to retain students that are leaving as early as third grade, and we'll, we will be able to capture students who may have attended a charter or a private school instead of Carrollwood altogether. This plan directly addresses the needs of the students, and it addresses the needs of the school district to demonstrate concern for children and a commitment of high quality education for the Carrollwood community. We need this on the agenda now to make it feasible for grade six classes to be in session for next year. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Brittany Cooper, and I'm here to address the need for a variety of different middle schools. So like uh, schools, students are all different, which means um, they require different types of learning, different types of environment. And I myself have three kids, and I can tell you that all three of them are different, which I'm sure you would agree with, um, with your own children. So a traditional middle school would be great for some children, but it also, a K-8 environment would be beneficial for others. I can tell you two of mine would be great in a K-8 environment. Um, what we're asking you today is for the opportunity for that smaller K-8 environment for the students at Carrollwood. Um, so I personally went to a smaller middle school and I felt very safe and was able to thrive and not be thrown into a bigger middle school. Um, so middle school is a hard enough time on its own. And so I think a more personalized and intimate um, learning environment would be very beneficial for the students at our school or just the opportunity. And that's mostly what I'm here to talk about with you guys today. Our Carrollwood K-8 ask is for that same opportunity for our students. So. Um, the same opportunity to walk to school, to stay connected with their peers, in an environment that's just easy and intimate and smaller. Um, so transitioning Carrollwood to a K-8 ensures the students stay in the Hillsborough County Public School Board oops, system <laughs> instead of uh, leaving the district. So I do wanna thank you guys again. You guys have gone out of your way to support us, to meet with us, to talk to us, to answer emails. And we are so thankful for, for you guys doing that. Um, we have a specific need for our specific community and we're hoping that this would be a solution to give these kids the opportunity. Um, so please support this initiative, add it to the agenda, vote yes, and give these kids that same opportunity to make Carol at a K-8. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Jenna Molassi. I have two kids at Carrollwood Elementary School. I am a former kindergarten teacher and I spend a lot of my time at the school, so much so that I should probably get hired there. Um, one committee that we are passionate about is our Owl Pantry. Our Owl Pantry is an in-house food pantry exclusively for our students and their families. We fundraise, collect food from local churches and families to send home for our students in need. We have about 50% economically disadvantaged <laughs> students. We service about 50 children weekly. I am so proud of our school 
and the demographically diverse students that are part of our community. As a teacher and lifelong learner, I not only want what is best for my children, but for the entire Carrollwood community that I call home. We are ready to transition to a K-8 model for the next school year. We have the space and the administration support to do so. This makes Carrollwood K-8 a reality. I encourage you to consider our plan in detail. Carrollwood families are fierce advocates of this change and we need your help to please make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And if the next few will line up. Hi, my name is Michelle Sanchez and I'm the media specialist at Wilson Middle School. I simply wanna express my gratitude to the board for trusting media specialists and our amazing district library media team. I appreciate that you continue to uphold our professional selection policies and our fair challenge procedures in the face of increased pressure to issue blanket bans on books. Limiting access to books based on the experiences and values of one group of citizens is wrong. Thank you for recognizing that family values can look very different from one family to another. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Debbie Hunt. First and foremost, I wanna thank you, Member Snively, um, for your incredible commitment and it has been so consistent and so for the kids of Hillsborough County. So thank you. Sorry to see you go. Um, I want to talk today about the tutoring program called PAPER being discussed by you all. Um, first, I do want to thank Terry Connor for um, sending a response to me on the questions that I had emailed everybody. Very much appreciated. We are still concerned about the vulnerability of the children's information and uh, their personal information and about the live, it's, and I'm quoting from the response, live educational entertainment platform, which includes gamified storylines and captivating storytelling. Um, we are also concerned with the generalized parent webinars and the schedule shared to promote the tutoring, which actually started back in February of 2022, when this is supposed to be um, new that you guys are continuing. Um, we do appreciate that the agenda item was moved from the consent agenda to the discussion agenda um, following your own process. Um, however, we are con concerned that the tutoring, and, and I provided a copy um, from your own website on the home page that speaks to the fact that it's already being advertised to the kids as being available before you all have had a chance to discuss and, and determine whether you're going forward or not. Um, finally, we're very concerned that you're willing to sign a contract that states neither party shall be liable, and I'm quoting directly from what you're going to sign, neither party shall be liable for direct, special, consequential, and or incidental damages arising out of or related Thank to you. the Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julie Gebhardt, and I guess I feel the need in the moment to just sort of give an, a, a sample of what we find in middle school. So if um, there are children in here, I would encourage you to um, maybe take them out as quickly as possible. Um, because here's a book that we have in a middle school um, that contains this. Uh, let's see. Uh, his palm rubbed across her nipple, causing it to harden, which Amma noticed as if watching from some distance rather than from within the skinny handled, running his hand across the downy nest of hair between her legs and then pushing his fingers inside of her, opening her in a way she had not known she could be opened. Um, those are just some samples. So I don't know if we're defending that. I mean, there's a lot of examples. I actually have a packet here that I'll give to you guys that has samples from four different books. And I know you encourage us to read the entire book, but reading the entire book does not remove the pornography from the book. It's really disturbing and very frustrating to hear people come and speak opposed to um, some of these books that, I mean, literally, I'm just gonna keep reading. 
Um, do it, she said. And this is just randomly off this page. House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J. Moss. We have seven copies in our book. She didn't feel him inside her. His fingers or his cock, anything. She might start begging. If she didn't feel him inside her, she might start begging. She buried her face in his neck, biting and licking, starving for any taste of him while he pumped his hand into her again. He breathes into her ear. I'm going to F you until you can't remember your goddamn name. I have plans for this beautiful ass, Bryce. Filthy, filthy plans. She moaned again as his fingers stroked her over and over again. Come for me, sweetheart, he purred against her breast, his tongue flicking over her nipple just as one of his fingers curled inside her, hitting that goddamn spot. <sighs> this is not okay. I, I don't care what library you're in charge of. This is, not con this is not content that is fit for young people. This is in middle schools, high schools, even some elementary schools. If you remember, All Boys Aren't Blue was in an elementary school, and I have evidence of that. Just elementary. All Boys Aren't Blue. Anal sex. Everything. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Next speaker. And the next five, please. Next five speakers, please. Good afternoon, board members. Um, I first want to start off by saying um, I agree with those parents that are up here talking about bullying over at Armwood. It's an ongoing issue that the principal is definitely not addressing. Okay. I'm here to express my high concerns for children that have been sitting in reading classes at Middleton High School for the past 12 weeks without any teachers yet receiving failing grades. These students have been sitting in this classroom for the past 12 weeks receiving worksheets and coloring sheets as juniors. We have children that are being bused into Middleton daily that are sent in front of teachers, but the kids from our community are not. I've asked the principal and the APs and called down downtown on several occasions asking why my son is sitting in a classroom on seventh period with no instruction, with no type of help, knowing that he would need reading to pass the FSA next year to graduate. I am tired of calling. I'm tired of saying the same thing over and over again. If we are here to advocate for all kids, all of our children need to be having teachers in front of them. And if you can't hire anyone, some from, from downtown, need to leave from their comfy offices and go back down to those classrooms where they were for the first 20 days before y'all signed off on those FTE dollars. Our kids deserve better, and I'm tired of saying the same thing over and over again. Also, I want to point out the fact that some, an agency was able to go over to Woodson and take a child from Woodson, and no one at the school knew what agency I knew who the person was that removed this child off the property. That is not okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good evening and thank you. My name is Kathy Henry and I'm here this evening uh, to uh, address my concerns concerning the school board allowing us, the people of the community, 5139 branch of the NAACP, to have space, office space to meet and conduct meetings and uh, that we can inform the community uh, with being able to come together with ways to partner with Tampa Police Department, the city mayor, and uh, we're being like bullet, I would say personally experienced myself. I've been to that office on several occasions. I was treated rudely and very unprofessional and I was went there to see what I can volunteer to do. And uh, it doesn't look good when we when I go up there myself personally and I see and know for facts that other organizations are meeting and there are rumors that they are being paid, the NAACP are being paid for these people to meet in this building. It, it's not a pretty picture here. So my plea this evening is if we can get some help 
as a, a organization to find out why we're being bullied. I call it bullying because that's my experience and uh, being mistreated and not able to come. So I'm here this evening because after experiencing personal October 20th, which should have been a general meeting for the members, and we turn out our numbers and we were very rudely locked out, would not even be addressed and asked to go in one of the other rooms by the president of this branch. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Okay, Joe Robinson, I want to have this slate of integrity received and filed in the record. That's who needs to be at the NAACP. Uh, we need a formal investigation. There was a uh, police call, uh, staff security call. The NAA, I'm second vice president, locked out. They want me out, but I'm going to turn the FBI informant in a minute. And it was public corrupt and people's civil rights was violated. The NAACP office needs to be shut down, and you need to follow your agreement that I signed, Yvette Lewis signed, you signed, Allison Davis, and the chair of this board, Ms. Lynn Gray, at the time in 2021. Number one, we was discriminated. It says, nor will any organization deny any person the opportunity to participate in activities conducted on the site with a capital S. That was done. We got video to prove it. Here's the biggest violation going on or allow any other organization or person to use any portion of the site, capital S, during the term of this agreement. That's happening. You just heard Florida Restoration, Q Dogs, the Divine Nine, and anybody else, including you, cannot go out there, Mr. Porter. You guys can't go out there because you are not members of the NAACP unless you are. So shut it down. We want an investigation, a forensic analysis of the NAACP financial money and all the stuff you're doing because they won't do an audit, I'm sick of it, and they want to throw me out, but on the way out, I don't want to push the predator on here, Mr. Porter. So Porter knows about it, Allison knows about it, Shake, you heard about it. Do something, man, because the vet lawyers is out of control, they're conspiring to deprive our civil rights, they're also not letting a public building be utilized according to the contract, they done violated it, they know it. There is no plausible deniability because she signed it. So, and I signed it. I'm here to be on the record to say, do something about it before I bring another organization in here to really investigate public corruption in the school district with the local branch of the NAACP. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Ron Vettelaro. Um I wanted to come up here to publicly congratulate my wife who got a uh, teacher of the year at her school. And um, today I got a text message saying, I need a new shirt. Mine is bloody and covered in vomit. Uh, she has a classroom with 10 children that have special needs. Um, and across the board, there's about, uh, well, I, I couldn't even tell you it's so many, but there are a lot of students there that are being underserved because of the classroom sizes and because of the lack of qualified teachers in the district because of the underfunding for the teacher salaries because for one reason or another the uh, steps were not honored or could not be honored but regardless you all have a choice and I would say responsibility because at this point is it up to, it's up to choice a yes or no vote and each one of you could make this happen and we're hearing all of these issues with the bullying kids are being bullied kids are being neglected and it's because there's no teachers to fill these vacancies and I could make a pretty well educated guess that it has a lot to do with the fact that their uh, salaries that they were told that they were going to get is not being honored so I just want you to know that every night it is on our entire family, it, the stress. It is very palatable on me, my two daughters, my wife. It comes home, and as somebody said, those hours that my wife's doing IEPs night after night or inserts, whatever she's doing for hours and hours and hours, those aren't covered. The, she's not, she's, like they said, her salary get docked, but it's not getting compensated on the other end. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Good evening. I'm Kimberly Henriquez. I'm a kinder garden teacher at Alry Elementary. I want to wish you all happy All Saints Day. I came early to speak because um, it's a holy day of obligation. I will be going to 7 p.m. Mass in Dunedin, which is where I live. So I've traveled a, quite a distance to be here. Um, last time I told you about my morning in the kindergarten classroom, I thought I'd share about the afternoon. And also I wanted to let you know that there is academics that go on, it just isn't recess and lunch. And one of my parents actually told me um, yesterday on the phone, she said, I'm so happy that my son is, we're in the car and he's seeing letters and he knows the name of the letter and the sound of the letter. And I'm like, yes, job well done, Henrikas. You're doing it. But, um, you know, like today, this afternoon, we have this new system where our principals get to pop in on us and I'm fine with it. It's okay. I'm, I'm me. I'm going to do me. You're going to see what you're going to see. I'm okay with that. But they were in there like right as I was coming in the door from lunch, which was a little hairy, but we made it through. I was very nervous because I knew that, I, oh my God, I need to be teaching math right now and I'm not teaching math and I'm going to get in trouble and, oh, ah, you know, just all the anxiety that comes with it. And, um, and then I found out we were down a kindergarten teacher today. Her son is sick and now we just found out she's sick, so she won't be here. Long story short, we had to, divide her class. We have one aid for seven teachers. It's just, it was a crazy day in the afternoon and, you know, the toilet got backed up because a child doesn't know how to wipe himself yet and I had to put my gloves on and clean that up and I'm in the middle of a lesson. I'm just like, are you kidding me? So two steps, I think that's a pretty good deal. I don't know. Yeah, I'm working 12 hour days. You're paying me for eight. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello. Happy Indigenous People Month. I'm here on behalf of the Native American and Alaska Native people in Hillsborough County. My name is Shannon Durant. I work with Title VI. I work with Florida Indigenous Alliance. So I'm here on a happy moment. I won't speak anything neg negative because I know that I come up here and speak very negative at times. So I just want to say happy things. I won't even spend my whole two minutes. I pr I've promised Jessica and Monica fry bread and wanjabi, and I brought you <laughs> fry bread and wanjabi. Yeah. And there's 40 pieces, so Please share. I do have one comment. I would like to thank Ms. Hahn for showing up today at a Native American event. So thank you. Thank you. I think we have two more speakers. Um, next speaker. Hi, Kelly Champion, Gaither High School. I spoke to the board about this very issue in September, so this is what's happened since. On October 4th, an adult male parent entered our gym from the student parking lot doors. Um, the doors frequently do not shut. We put MRs in. They come fix them a couple of days later. To no avail, students love to prop things in the doors to keep them open. The male happened to be a parent just looking for a student. We asked him to exit the gym and go around to the main office. He complied and was very nice about it. This might not have been the case with every person that enters that gym, though the way that he entered. On October 28th, walking back from an activity out on the fields, I saw a young male, most likely a student, I'm not sure. Um, I asked him, he was attempting to enter the gym doors as well. I asked him to please go around. This is a classroom, this is not the entrance of school. He suddenly just ran up to the orchestra doors, which are right next to the gym doors, and he pulled those open, walked right in. The doors were not secure. Again, I did another MR. The doors were fixed today to, um, from what my custodian told me. Um, it's a safety aspect. We have begged the district for years to have one fence from that orchestra door down to the driver's ed room. If you know Gaither's layout, you understand what I'm talking about. Our ADA did express that someone from the county came to look at such issues. She's like, I'm not promising you anything. I've been at that site for eight years. I've been asking for six years for one fence. To, I understand that fences are not protectors of everything, but they do deter people from coming in the way they're not supposed to. There are 15 exterior doors that lead to my classroom. That's including the orchestra doors, 15. Ponder that. I don't want to be the next Parkland, Columbine, or St. Louis, Missouri. 
we have to fight this every single day of people banging on our doors during our classroom. My students know do not open those doors. Other students in other classes, they'll pop them right open. Lastly, in our driver's ed room, there is a hole about the size of this desk right here. It was just plywood put over it, hammered down, starting to crack around. Hopefully nobody falls through. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our uh, public comment. We will now move on to our recognition and proclamations. AO1, Adoption of Proclamation, National School Psychology Week, November 7th to November 11th, 2022. Member Hahn will be highlighting this proclamation. Thank you, Member Combs. National School Psychology Week highlights the important work school psychologists and other educators do to prepare students for life. The National Association of School Psychologists declared this year's theme as Together We Shine, which emphasizes the importance of reconnecting with others and reestablishing a sense of being valued parts of a greater whole. Despite difficulties created by the pandemic, social injustice, inequity, economic stress, and the impact on mental and physical health, school psychologists endeavor to help students and their families thrive. School psychologists provide direct support and interventions to students, consult with educators and mental health professionals, and collaborate with community providers to coordinate needed services. They help schools successfully improve academic achievement, promote positive behavior and mental health, and create safe, positive school climates. Our schools will recognize school psychologists on school marquees, morning shows, and social media accounts, posters, and wall art. Thank you so much to our school psychologists. Thank you, Member Hahn. I need a motion and a second to approve National School Psychology Week, November 7th through November 11th, 2022. I have a motion by Member Perez, and I have a second by Member Hahn. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. AO3, Adoption and Proclamation, American Education Week, November 14th to the 18th, 2022, and National Education Support Professionals Day, November 16th, 2022. Member Snively will be highlighting this proclamation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Public education is the backbone of our nation, providing young people with tools they need to maintain our values of freedom, civility, and equality. Public education employees work tirelessly to serve our children and communities with care and professionalism, whether they are teachers, counselors, custodians, bus drivers, clerical or food service professionals. Public schools are the foundation of neighborhoods and communities, bringing everyone together in a common enterprise. American Education Week gives us the opportunity to advocate for local, state, and federal policies that guarantee an equal opportunity for all students to succeed share with our per personal and professional networks about challenges facing our students, educators, and public schools, and work together to find solutions for these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Member Snively. I need a motion and a second to approve American Education Week, November 14th to the 18th, 2022, and National Education Support Professionals Day, November 16th, 2022. I have a motion by Member Snively. I have a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? you want to speak? Member Gray, do you want to speak? Right. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Member Snively, uh, for reading a very critical proclamation. Public schools is the livelihood and lifehood of, of our children, uh, young adult students. And uh, I just think matching our public schools uh, notoriety and importance is also um, our teachers, which make the public schools function as they do, and uh, recognizing them as well, um, thanking them as well uh, at this point in time. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Gray. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. AO4 recognition for the family of heroes in education. Member Snively will be highlighting this recognition. Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, I would like to introduce Anne Marie Courtney, the Supervisor of uh, Partnership Engagement and Philanthropy for our school district, who will present this proclamation. Good afternoon, Mr. Board Members, Ms. Savannah, and Cabinet Members. 
Today we recognize some of our employees who have shown meaningful acts of kindness to others in their daily work environments. Scott Adams once said, remember there's no such thing as a small act of kindness. Each act creates a ripple with no logical end. In each of the video submissions, the person making the nominations stated why their colleague should be recognized as a hero in education. Let's watch a montage of the submitted winning videos. I love when I find people who try to multiply their impact outside of just their regular job. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're a speech language pathologist. I am. And that you work very hard with your actual caseload of your students, but you yes. do so much more than that in our school. And this GEMS program is something really, really, really special. They have been just so incredible, um, absolutely loving. They made me feel so comfortable every single day coming to work. And no question felt unimportant or not valued. Their excitement for their job every single day, the way that they make people feel, the way that they make families feel, is something that just sets a tone for our entire building. A staff member who is always so kind and willing to help just about anyone is our media specialist, Ms. Christy Mayfield. She does so many innovative projects for not only our kids, but as a star, our staff as well, um, including even just having uh, fun uh, baked goods she likes to make for meetings uh, to make things more interesting. I'm nominating Ileana Zollner from Buckhorn Elementary to be my hero in education for her kindness in adversity. Ms. Leah is always kind to my special needs daughter, Jessica, although Jessica may not always be kind to her. Ms. Leah is wonderful, despite the adversity she may face every day. She's the literal definition of kindness at heart. She bends over backwards for our faculty, our staff, our parents, and our students. She has helped set up our food pantry, which serves over 40 families each week. She's the backbone of this school. She's who everybody looks for, for a smile, a high five, or a hug. And she it brings so much joy to our school in every way. Amazing videos. We'd like to thank um, Adria from our communications department for compiling these videos for us. And at this time, I would like to introduce Ward Cox, administrator for the nonprofit organization for the family. It's a pleasure to see all of you this afternoon. Thank you so much for everything that you all did to help our Heroes in Education program take off in its first year. I think that the best is yet to come, and I'm so excited about working with Hillsborough County Schools. We've been able to do that since 2012. I would like to extend a special thank you to both Anne Marie Courtney and also to Ray Padgett. Their support has been critical in our partnership and its effectiveness and in how it's grown. Their suggestions have meant the world to us. And of course, it's a distinct pleasure to join you in recognizing the caring spirit that is plain to see throughout Hillsborough County Public Schools. We at For the Family are grateful to the board and superintendent for their continued support. Now we can be loud and proud in honoring the heroes in education who have been nominated by their peers in smartphone videos that give kindness the visibility that it deserves. Their examples underscore how the art of caring about others is alive and well in our community. It's my honor to introduce you to these extraordinary heroes in education who are kindness ambassadors at their schools and wherever they go. Please save your applause until each honoree has been introduced. From Miles Elementary, it's my pleasure to introduce speech and language specialist Megan Kearney. Our next honorees are the office staff at Boyette Springs Gifted Center, Wendy Taylor, Lori Botts, and June Hall. Mm -hmm. 
Our next honoree is Christina Mayfield, media specialist at Lincoln Elementary Magnet. From Buckhorn Elementary, ESE paraprofessional, Ileana Zollner. And our final honoree for 2002, Faith Smith, parent liaison at Temple Terrace Elementary. In fact, each Hero in Education nominee is a hero to us, not only because of their positive example, but because of who they are. We're already looking forward to the heroes who will be nominated in next year's observance. Every video nomination is also being considered for a Family Flame Award at the 7th Annual National Fam Awards on November 18th at the Children's Board of Hillsborough County. That's the Friday before Thanksgiving. Congratulations to all of our Heroes in Education, and thank you again. Thank you. And I, I think a few of the members wanted to make some comments. Uh, Member Gray. Mr. Cox, Ward Cox, um, and uh, just have to say a big thank you because I know you started this uh, since I got, uh, was, well, on the board 2016, and look what you've done. You've uh, manifested uh, acts of kindness among students, among staff among our leaders, and it resonates throughout the communities. And uh, I, I think that the very basis of every one of our thoughts should rely on kindness, be good to others and to be kind. And you have exemplified that with your own self, but also with all the lineage that you have uh, in front of you and on your side, and uh, Anne Marie Courtney, thank you so much. Um, you're a wonderful man, and and thank you for doing what you've done. Thank you, Member Member Gray, Member Snively. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I also want to extend my gratitude to Mr. Cox for his partnership with our school district. And um, thank you, Anne Marie, Courtney, and, and your team for working together to promote uh, kindness in our schools. I think this is a wonderful program, and I'm looking forward to, well, I, you all can look forward to. <laughs> I'll be watching it from home, maybe <laughs> in the future. Uh, but um, but I think it's a wonderful program, and I hope to see it continue throughout the district. And um, and I will say because I had um, a child that attended Boyette Springs uh, Elementary School, and they they are a wonderful front office team. Um, and I hope to visit them one more time before I leave office and maybe bring them a treat for being such a wonderful office team. So uh, they always came, welcomed me with a smile. Um, anybody who came in the office uh, the entire time my son attended school there, and it was just a, a wonderful way to get welcome, welcomed so I can understand why they're so deserving of this recognition. So the, the whole group is amazing. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you for doing that. I, there's no question, especially in the world that we live in today, that kindness does matter, and recognizing people who do wonderful things. I mean, there's so many people we could recognize, but I, I'm glad to see that program. Thank you very much. AO5 now, Adoption of Proclamation for Native American and Alaska Native Heritage Month, November 2022. Member Vaughn will be highlighting this proclamation. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
What started at the turn of the century as an effort to gain a day of recognition for the significant contributions the first Americans made to the establishment and growth of the United States has resulted in a whole month being designated for that purpose. In 1990, President George H.W. Bush approved a joint resolution designating November 1990 National American Indian Heritage Month. During this month, the school board encourages administration and staff to thoughtfully plan culturally sensitive school-wide activities and lessons for students that further explore the history and culture of Native American and Alaska, Alaskan Native people and to celebrate the considerable role the first Americans played in the establishment and growth of our nation. The school board acknowledges the importance of honoring these contributions, achievements, and the cultural and historical legacy of the Native American and Alaska, Alaskan Native people. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. I need a motion and a second to approve the Native American and Alaskan Native Heritage Month, November 2022. I have a motion by Member Perez, and I have a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? Member Vaughn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm I'm just really honored to be able to um, to read this proclamation. I think it's really important. I'm um, in a time right now where there's misinformation about Native American people and whether or not they were the first people in this country. Um, I want to thank um, Shannon. Thank you for the fry bread out there. Um, the last meeting, I wanted to thank Title VI, and I made a mistake and I said Title V. But thank you, Title VI, for all your advocacy to make sure that Native American students are treated kindly and respectfully and all that you do to make sure that they're at the forefront of education um, and that's all thank you thank you please vote when your lights appear and it passes unanimously our final resolution is in honor of member Snively this evening we will now recognize the service of outgoing member Melissa Snively and read is that resolution in her honor. Member Snively, I have the honor to do that. Whereas Mrs. Melissa Snively has served eight years as a member of the school board of Hillsborough County, being elected in 2014 and reelected in 2018 as a representative from District 4, she's also served as chair and vice chair. And whereas Mrs. Melissa Snively has been passionate advocate for District 4, she's never shied away from being an unapologetic voice of her constituents. And whereas Melissa Snively has helped lead our district and our community through one of the toughest times in history, the COVID-19 pandemic. She advocated for her constituents through some of the most contentious decisions our board has ever had to make always with parental choice at the forefront. And whereas Melissa Snively helped guide the district's first strategic plan toward raising graduation rates, she was an integral part in seeing the graduation rate jump from 73.5 in 2014 to 89.2 in 2021. And whereas over her eight years on the board, Mrs. Snively has seen record growth in her part of the district. She's been a tireless champion for her schools and families by advocating for necessary boundary changes to alleviate overcrowded schools. And whereas Mrs. Snively has always been a strong promoter of safer roadways and lobbied extensively for safer transportation for our students. And whereas Mrs. Snively has been an active member of the Tampa Bay community, serving on numerous boards and committees, including the PTSA, American Cancer Society, the Junior League, Boy Scouts of America, the Brandon Community Roundtable, and Tampa Theater, and whereas Mrs. Snively has used her leadership skills and experiences and a successful small business owner to work harmoniously with other members of the board and district leaders to promote a safe and thriving district community. And whereas Mrs. Snively is, above anything else, a wife and mom. Her four children all attend Hillsborough County Public Schools, and Mrs. Snively always used her experiences as a mom to help guide her through the toughest district decisions. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the School Board of Hillsborough County, Florida, deems it fitting and proper to publicly recognize the distinguished contributions of Melissa Snively and to express its great appreciation to Mrs. Snively for her efforts and work at Hillsborough County Public Schools board member from 2014 to 2022. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution, the certified by the Superintendent 
of School of Hillsborough County, Florida, and immediately presented to Mrs. Snively, adopted this first day of November 2022. Member Snively, we have this for you. We have a, a beautiful student work. And this is from, this, all of this is from the... And then from the board, we have nice flowers. flowers. And we have a, a great oh, jar. And you'll see there's <laughs> presents and gifts and cards. So Presents and gifts and cards. Oh, oh my. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. You want to uh, give yes. a, a stand up? Yes, to yes, yes. Yeah. stand up. <laughs> Woo! Member Snively, we would love to hear from you. Thank you, Member Combs and board members and superintendent and Mr. Porter and district staff. It has been an incredible eight years serving this community. I've been very honored to serve uh, District 4 in the capacity of a board member through many ups and downs and challenges. I think this is probably one of the most challenging times to ever serve on any school board across the United States of America. Uh, and I have learned so much. I've learned so much from so many people. I have gotten a chance to work with people I never dreamed I'd get to work with. But most importantly, I've gotten a chance to serve students across the, the district who I absolutely love. And, and anybody knows this, that when some days are harder than others, um, especially when you sometimes think you, you're you're never going to make the right decision because you're always going to make 50% of the population happy and the other 50% angry. Um, Any time I felt discouraged or doubt, I would visit a classroom and immediately remember, this is why we do what we do. Because the students always lift everybody up. They always lift up the adults and they remember help us remember that it's not about the grown-ups it's about the children and um, I want to especially thank my family my husband who's here David who has um, had to put up with my phone calls on the way back from board meetings <laughs> for the last eight years because he's usually the first person I call when I get in the car <laughs> to download <laughs> Uh, so I want to uh, thank you, David, um, from the bottom of my heart. You're my rock. Uh, you're my support. You're the one who believes in me sometimes when I don't even believe in myself. And I appreciate that. And I want to thank my children who um, have had to put up with a lot as well of, of uh, me not being necessarily around as much as I'd like to be. But um, they have had an amazing education and two have graduated from Hillsborough County Public Schools and two are still um, in school and will be graduating in the next few years from Newsom High School. So we're pretty excited about that. I'm most excited about being a band parent actually because my youngest son, our youngest son plays the alto saxophone and um, he joined the marching band and we've been at many band competitions and performances and football games and so it's been really fun and I look forward to doing more of that more spending time with family and more spending time um, uh, at my office. And that's the other group I'd like to thank. Uh, they're probably not watching, but <laughs> but uh, my office team is amazing and I wouldn't be able to have a small business and own a, a small business in our community without the support of um, my, my employees and keeping my customers happy through um, their amazing support um, and being able to be here when I, I can feel really confident that they're taking care of my my customers when I'm not there. So, um, Mr. Superintendent, thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. Let's see over the flowers. <laughs> it's been a pleasure working with you, albeit a short period of time. Um, 
I've had the opportunity to work with three superintendents in my tenure, and all three very different personalities. Um, right, Mr. Porter? And um, it's been a pleasure. I was very honored to be on the board that selected you for this school district, and um, I, I believe in my heart and in my mind that you are uh, the right person for this district at the time that we hired you and that you're going to do the right thing for our school district moving forward and so i look forward to hearing more um, successes in our school district and mr porter it's been a pleasure working with you as well over these last you've taught me a lot about parliamentary procedure and <laughs> parliamentary procedure and bobby's rules of order <laughs> That's what we'll call that. Um, but thank you for everything that you've done to support not just me, but every board member. And I know every board member appreciates that. So, um, and thank you, especially super, super, super grateful to the secretaries in the school board office, uh, especially specifically Lori Powell, Lori, who used to be um, the superintendent's secretary and moved, transitioned to the school board office as the school board secretary, kind of leading that team upstairs. And they are an amazing group of people to, who, to, who help us uh, stay organized and get where we need to be and know what we need to know. And um, uh, they're very, very um, supportive of everything that we do and so I'm very appreciative of Lori and the team upstairs so um, so with that thank you very much it's been an honor working with everyone it's been a pleasure mostly and <laughs> and I look forward to spending some qual more quality time with my family and my business um, but I hope that I get to keep in touch with many people here in the school district because I will miss everybody that I've been able to work with everyone that I've been able to work with. Thank you. Thank you. And I know um, all the board members would like to have some comments. Uh, Member Perez, I'll start with you. Member Snively. So, you know, I've had the amazing honor. I, when I first ran, I ran with you, um, you know, for your reelection and my first election. And, you know, what I think a lot of people don't really see is the work that we do. Um, beyond this dais, you know, when we go up to Tallahassee, when we really take, you know, the lead in fighting for our children, you know, fighting for the district, um, speaking to the upper leadership and the needs for this district. And, you know, I've learned a lot from you. You know, um, I don't know if a lot of people know that you, you were, you know, you sat on the board for the Florida um, School Board Association and I will be filling your shoes um, behind that. So, you know, watching you take the charge on that, um, I learned a lot. And so I hope to do the, the same great work that you did, you know, um, and fill, you know, those shoes and, and help this district the way you have. So thank you for the experience that you um, taught me and, you know, the education you gave me. Um, you know, because together, I think all of us have our ideas that we bring to this table, but working together, it moves the district along. So thank you for everything, and it's been an awesome pleasure for me to work with you. And I wish you all the best in your new chapter. Thank you, Member Prez. Member Hahn? This is not a roast, Dr. Hahn. I just I want to remind you. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is going to be a tough one for me, for sure. Um, you know, we've been friends before I became a board member, and we always tease that you're my sister from another mister, and, and you are. I adore you. And every once in a while, you meet a person that you instantly click with, and you are definitely one of those people for me. So, um, you know, it's, it's just been such a wonderful experience to work with you as a board member over the last four years. Um, it's obviously deepened our friendship. And as two of the few board members that have served on this board pre-COVID and then post-COVID, it's a really unique bond that I would say you and Member Gray and uh, Member Perez and I have going through that experience together. Um, you really set the tone of uh, professionalism, um, not just during that time, but through the entire time you've been on this board. And, um, 
you know, you have a very strong legacy that you leave behind, not just all the, you know, obviously in all the wonderful things that um, Member Combs mentioned, but um, also the way that you built relationships that will, that have um, grown into a great amount of support for this district that will continue to live on. So uh, you've really been a true champion for children in your role as a school board member. Um, gosh, you know, I, I'm going to miss you more than I can really even say. And um, because there's nothing better when you work with a friend, you know, it makes those really challenging times more bearable and it makes the good times even uh, more exciting. So I will miss that. Um, and I wish you success wherever you go and whatever you do in your next chapter. And I, I also pray that God will bless you and keep you safe all the days that we're not together. Um, but I do, I, I, I hope that, um, you know, you do, you continue to, I, I hope that you choose to take a little break and obviously, you know, reconnect with your family and um, recharge your batteries and then jump back in and continue to serve your community in some, in some way. And I think you will, I hope you do. Um, I love you, my friend, and uh, go Gators. So um, I wish you the best. Thank you, Member Hahn, Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want, to look, I want to make sure my wife is looking because she told me not to cry because I am a big crybaby. Believe me, Cheryl, I'm not crying. First, Ms. Snivett, I want to thank you for your support and your knowledge. Uh, you have always been a supporter of mine, and I really appreciate that, and especially the knowledge that you have. You know, we're losing you. We are losing a lot of knowledge, especially in the financial department. Because there's so much we don't know about budgets and so forth. And you always led that charge. Um, and, and just being making the school board successful. You know, we have different personalities and everybody is unique in what they do. And I want to truly say you stand up for what you believe in. No matter what, who against you, it doesn't make a difference. You stand up for it. And I really, I truly respect you for that, Melissa. Um, and for all your hard work and dedication because you truly work hard and you're very dedicated to the students and parents in this community. And I want to say to you, you always put students first, no matter what. And that's one of the things that I admire the most about you, you put students first. So I thank you and David out there, you, you'll have more time with the wife now. So uh, thank you for all that you have done. And, and remember, I love you too. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Gray? So, Member Snively, I was taking my long run this morning and reflecting, as I usually do, and I thought many things, many great thoughts that resonate from the um, from your recognition. And I, I wanted to say, um, when I, and most people, when they get on a board, you know, who are you most uh, alike? Or what, what, what person can you draw knowledge from? Uh, and trust, and uh, you know, remarkably, um, you came uh, at least in in my world with um, family first, with values of honesty, integrity, with uh, goodwill, kindness. Uh, your moral compass in, in is to me uh, has always been outstanding. We have gone, as uh, Member Hahn has said, through very tough times, very tough times, in, in terms of um, argumentatively probably the most difficult in any school board history, I would say. And your characteristics uh, of, of being a true hero, a true leader, um, and, and a, a dedicated to the well-being of our students and dedicated to our district and continually devoted to your school, the schools that you serve, who always remind me of how much they value you. And I, I would say you are emblematic of, of a, not only a wonderful person inside, but you have given all of us a more of a commanding profile as a, as a board. Uh, you have added um, 
I want to say, an astute sense of professionalism. Uh, as chair, you added also leadership with kindness and, again, goodwill. I say that often. Um, and you've been extremely patient, especially with board members like me who have a tendency to go on and on. Um, and I, I know that, you know, we had, you and I have had differences, and this is something for the world to see right now. We, we are of two different kinds, uh, and yet we had forged a relationship where we got along very fine. And, uh, and I know that we're nonpartisan, but mind you, we, we worked together and we disagreed, but we got back to the agreeable and never really f had fights. And I relied on your, as uh, Sheikh Washington said, the financial prospectus, mm -hmm. and in turn you relied on me for more of the instruction. So we had a really good relationship. And, uh, and in our superintendent, we both agreed. And we knew that the change was, had to be had. And so I'm, I'm going to finish because, as usual, I went a little bit over. But I also have tears, and I, I cried this morning because I recognize that I'm going to miss you very, very much. And I do love you also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Member Vaughn? Well, those are some hard acts to follow. Um, you know, I haven't been able to work with you very long. It's only been two years, and it's been a very, very fast two years. It went by quickly. And it has been some of the, the hardest two years for school boards in general. Um, and we had a bit of a bumpy start. but. What I want to echo is that you are never afraid to speak up for your constituency, even if it's unpopular, that you come in and, and you be the voice for them. And a lot of people don't understand how hard that is. And you are perfectly right when you say no matter what decision you make or what you're advocating for or who you're trying to represent, you're going to have people who you make unhappy and you're always going to be the villain to someone and the hero to someone else. Um, but I do admire that you know we have been able to build a relationship where I feel it's mutually respectful and even if we're on opposing side of the issue sometimes I feel like the perspective that you bring has value and you look at my perspective and vice versa and I really appreciate that and change is always hard you know when you build relationships and you work with co co-workers and one of them leave it's always hard to embrace that change but I, I know good things are going to happen for you I know that your small business will do well and that you'll stay engaged in the community and I know all of our fellow board members wish you nothing but the the best and we appreciate the time we had with you um, thank you. And Member Snidely, I also wanted to say, you know, although I've only been here two years, I have so much respect for you serving for eight years. It is such a difficult job, and I always feel like you always put students first. You, you understand as a mother to see all the challenges that our children face today, and I think it's so important. I really respect your leadership. I think it's important. We want a board that is not all like-minded. We need different opinions. We need different uh, expressions. We need different, from different districts, we need a, a balance to hear different perspectives. I think that's very important, and you bring a lot of that. Your strength and your opinion, I really want you to know that I have a lot of respect for you. You brought so much leadership to this district, and I want to thank you for that. And on a lighter note, one of the things I'm going to miss most is your laugh. <laughs> Because you have such a great laugh, and you know when things are sometimes so challenging, it's really important to laugh and remember it's really not about us; it's about the students, and it's about all the employees and the teachers and the and the the you know the administrators and the custodians and everyone who we all work together. At the end of the day, it's so much not about us, but about the people that depend on us. So I just want to thank you for your leadership, and I wish you all the best. And I know that we'll keep in touch, and I wish you all the best as you move on to the next part of your life. And I know Superintendent Davis, he wanted to make a comment as well. Yes, ma'am. You know, everyone spoke so eloquently about your leadership. When you hear terms such as, um, you know, strong advocate, stability, consistency, uh, a role model, students first, child-centric, um, you know, one that continues to be an active voice for her community, that all represents who you are, Ms. Nively. And the only place to really start for me is saying thank you. 
Thank you for your dedication, your efforts, your your time. But, you know, eight years on a school board is a very long time. But it's also a time to be able to understand every facet that you can to be able to lead and be a nurturer and mentor to every one of the board members and also every one of the staff members, inclusive of myself. And I thank you for taking a chance on me. You know, we have we have learned, we've, we've grown together, we've had some hard conversations together, we've, uh, you know, uh, uh, maximized uh, coaching opportunities together, and I'm so thankful for that process. And um, that, that, that relationship will never go away. I, you know, I hope that we can continue to build. And you have been an exemplar for so many, and, and for many in, in my household as well, being a strong young woman that has dr been driven and professional along the way and, and has taken courageous steps that many have not taken and willing to take. So thank you for being a trailblazer. And for that, I thank you, and this, and this entire staff thanks you as well, because you have been truly an exemplar and a role model within this community and in this district. In, in our efforts, we always talk about how every single day, you know, we always talk about every single day how everyone we come to work gets our best and our family gets the rest. You know, we hope now that that could be able to flip in the family and for all of us can have that balance. So thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Where were you going to take it? Thank you guys for being patient. Start right at seven. I'll go wherever y'all want me to go. <laughs> hey, dumb man. Madam Chair, I just want to say thank you again uh, for all of your kind and humbling words. Um, I just am so honored. It, it's weird not to, but this is the last board meeting that I'll be attending. Um, but I'm so happy for the next person who's going to be here that everyone has met. And I want to congratulate Patty Rendon again. I'm, I supported her, endorsed her for her election and um, we're, you're going to you're going to love her. She's going to be a great representative for District 4. I'm very excited for her. And um, I just want to thank you again. And at the end of the day, we we all want the same thing. We all want to do what's right and we all want to make a difference. And um, I hope that I hope that I have. I hope looking back that people will say that I impacted in a positive way the lives of children in our school district. Thank you. Thank you.
you. Thank you very much. It is now just a minute after six. We're going to move right to employee input, and thank you for your employees who are here today. We'll now take employee input. Even though we hear public comment at the beginning of the meeting, it is sometimes difficult for employees of our district to attend meetings at 4 p.m. There are many ways for employees to make their voices heard, including through union representatives, emails, phone calls, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and public comment at the beginning of the meeting. The board wants to hear from you. With this section of our agenda, we're creating another avenue for employees to speak to the board. We're setting aside 30 minutes for employees of the district to speak to the board about any issues that are on your mind. This is not intended to be a discussion about a specific agenda item on tonight's agenda, but rather an opportunity for you to speak to the board about any issues related to your job or the district. Each speaker this evening will have three minutes. I will now call up the first speaker. Thank you. Mr. Crete. Good evening, Rob Crete, President of CTA. Uh, Member Snively, congratulations. Uh, and you are absolutely accurate. The past few years in this field, whether you're in the school board member, whether you're an employee, whether you're a classroom teacher, an aide, an ESP, those doing the job, it has been more difficult than ever before. This board needs to recognize that. When we look at the Hillsborough County Board website, we have, uh, there are salary schedules there. And it says that this document contains a salary schedule applicable to employee groups pursuant to negotiated agreements with respective unions, yada, yada, yada. Hey, uh, ultimately, the posted salary schedules are what we're asking for at the table. We agree. We can do this right now. We can just get that done. We're in. Now, all of these people, all of these employees here, the administrators, the teachers, the support professionals, everyone deserves raises. We all agree on that. That's not what we're fighting about. We're talking about the conditions of what we're doing in the classroom. We're talking about the posted salary schedules, and we agree to them. We want that to happen. So unfortunately, we're going to be going to um, impasse. Um, it's disappointing, and above the required 3% 3 3 fund balance is not helping any student reach their potential. It's not lowering our large class sizes, and it's not meeting the students' growing needs. Okay? This should have been done months ago, but yet here we are at impasse. We look forward to making our case for our students, for our employees, and for our communities on November 29th. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. Stuart Middle, robotic teacher. Um, I would like to have my planning period back because I'm always coveting because we don't have enough teachers. So what I plead is, please, we need more teachers. And we need air conditioning that is reliable more than 60% of the time. In our school, our school is never 100% with air conditioning. When you get one side, the other one goes off. Thank you, and thank you for repairing mine. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I'm from Venota Sasa Elementary School. And we have extremely overcrowded classrooms in spite of having four academic coaches on campus. Hello, I'm from Limona Elementary. We still don't have our math books. We've made thousands and thousands of copies. Thank you, Ms. Vaughn, for sending us five reams of paper this week. Um, but yes, we have no math books. And I have to make copies of tests, quizzes, homework, classwork, everything. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for the jobs that you do. Um, one of my great concerns is the number of young teachers leaving, not because necessarily salary, but because of conditions. The stress of the job, as was said, is incredible. But along with that, we have no textbooks. 
We have overcrowded classes. In fact, we're down to two fourth grade teachers with 27 in each room because the district cut one of our positions. Our support staff, guidance counselors, social workers, school psychologists don't exist. We have, I'm sure all of us are seeing, increased aggression with young students who don't know their coping skills in order to handle their anger. Without support staff, it's very difficult for us to live our dream, Ms. Snidely, of meeting those needs of children. Air conditioning refurbished is breaking now more than the original air conditioning. Teaching in 82.5 degree classrooms is a real challenge. <clears throat> From Sims, we're hoping that these conditions can improve um, so that we can better um, meet the needs academically and emotionally of our students. Thank you. Mackenzie Roberts, Kingswood Elementary. Thank you for having us today. One of our big concerns is the vacancies. The vacancies. You, all of you who are not helping us fill these vacancies, this is the issue. We need to retain teachers, keep them. I just had our guidance counselor resign last week. These are very important positions. We still have two instructional openings, and in addition to the guidance counselor, plus we still have a para opening. This is a really big concern for our school. We need them staffed, we need our children taken care of. Also, all the deployments that happened in our ESE staffing area office have hindered our ESE students in the correct placement and the support that I need as the ESE contact, and I'm sure the other 50 to 80 schools that the staffing specialists were then trying to keep up and take care of all those other schools so please help us out we want to make Hillsborough County number one and continue to be there for our kids and here's my little sign and thank you very much thank you next speaker please Good evening. My name is Keisha Sales. I'm a teacher at Sly Middle School. I, I was called to come over from Blake High School. And since I've been there, I'm the only science teacher there. I'm also covering classes during my conference and my break as well as my colleagues. We don't have a break. I teach science. I, ha I don't have a break to prepare my classrooms for the next lesson when we have science lab. I'm running back and forth. We had several teachers just walk off the job. And so now all the other teachers that are there have to pick up the slack. We're not getting paid, we're not getting compensated, and we don't have any breaks. So I'm just asking, will you think about that when you make your decisions? Please hire more teachers, please pay. I've been teaching for 25 years and this has been the most challenging year of my teaching career. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, my name is Ebony Robinson. I'm also from Sly Middle Magnet School. Um, so a concern at our school is high teacher turnover. You just heard from my colleague, we're covering classes. We're trying to support our students behaviorally, academically, and we do need teachers to be able to stay on. This is my first time ever speaking at one of these, so you know I really hope you guys are listening to us because I'm kind of nervous being up here. Um, but that's what we need, we need, we need teachers to be able to come in this is unfortunately it's not supposed to be a dying field when I came here I moved here from Illinois I have a degree in education and I was like okay I'm gonna go into school and I'm gonna do this and then I you could hear the morale of the other teachers there they're not staying there the, the support isn't there the money isn't there we're trying to help our students we're trying to change cultures and it's not happening and it's part of it is the pay part of it is that you don't have enough staff so if we could please get the support that we need and just following the contract that that was really confusing for me is I, I'm reading my contract I'm, out, I'm like okay so this is what's supposed to happen and I'm like what do you mean it's not happening I'm confused what do you mean I'm not getting steps I don't I don't know what that means it's very new to me coming you know from a, another district where you had steps by years you have steps by education and we don't even have the steps by education option anymore so i mean i don't know that if we could just get something in order and we're all on the same page and we're just doing this we're supposed to all be doing this for the kids but i don't feel like you we need each other 
And so that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Richard Paz. I'm from Piso K8. Um, I'm the lead rep over there. So the main issue, lack of sub coverage. Um, some people in other schools apparently are missing teachers. That's very unfortunate. I I'm at least at a school where we cover most of the positions. There's only a few slots, but this is our main issue, that when we don't have our teachers, we don't have subs. So it always has to be, we take it upon ourselves to split amongst ourselves and work as a team, especially in my middle school, and try and cover the holes every single time. And it would be nice if we actually had the uh, subs guaranteed, or at least a, a good amount of subs, to cover us in our time of need when we're out, whether for ailments, whether for family, whether for you know anything that happens in our lives. That's all. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Joanne Jameson, and I'm at, from Valrico Elementary School, and I've taught in this district for more than 20 years, and I have more than 30 years of experience, and this is a very difficult year. At our school, we, of course, have grade levels that are not having the pleasure and luxury of textbooks still, and we are going through boxes and boxes of paper because students don't need textbooks that they need to be recording their thinking on paper of some sort so they can discuss their thinking. So we need your help in getting those materials to our teachers. But from our members, our biggest concern at Valrico is our aging technology. At Valrico Elementary, we do, we do not get uh, Tier 3 funding. We do not have a PTA that can come in and fund. And our technology is dying. Our document cameras are too expensive. Our PTA can't buy them. We don't have funds. We're working on hand-me-down computers and laptops. We're one of those schools that's in the middle that doesn't get things. We don't get cycled until the very end of a cycle. And I'm asking for your help because most of what teachers need to access is on computers. The teachers did get new laptops this year. We do have some laptops in our classrooms, but we are not a one-to-one. -one school and our laptops that our students have are of poor quality. We want our students to be as technology, technologically advanced as any other students. We, they don't have a lot of technology in their homes and we're asking for you to help us with this need. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker please. Hi there. Kingsley Kelly Peritino, Lewis Elementary, the State Day School. It's really difficult to find things about Lewis that aren't amazing. However, we went with no elevator for 25 days. We have a wheelchair-bound student who is carried up a flight of stairs at least four times a day by our resource officer, Officer James. That was an ADA non-compliance. Um, our elevator was fixed at the end of last week, and the stairs that our officer had to carry him up and down were chipped and broken. So, help. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Jessica Wug. I'm also from Lewis Elementary. Um, at our school, we were without working copy machines for three weeks. And also, we found out that our office staff is not able to purchase toner for one of our copiers because they get questioned or are not able to provide the toner that they need as frequently as it's needed. Um, we also were without, uh, we still have teachers without math textbooks as um, echoed from some of the other speakers tonight. And we have teachers with insufficient resources for the number of students in their rooms. So um, these issues really are things that need to be dealt with and taken care of. Um, for our students, for our staff, we are working tirelessly to meet the needs of our students, and without these resources, it becomes more and more difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Maria Calvo from Deer Park. Um, right now, what I have written on my paper is that we are still waiting for textbooks, like other people have said. We also have classrooms where there are more kids than textbooks. It may sound trivial, but it makes a hard job harder. Um, this is my 31st year. You would think by now everything should be nice and smooth and easy. It isn't. And I know many people 
who are within five years, 15 years, 20 years, who are unhappy and are thinking about leaving. I know you've heard this over and over, but at some point it's got to start sinking in and we need to be making a difference because we are here for the kids, but we need to feel that somebody's here for us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, um, my name is Rachel Johnson, and I'm a teacher at Bailey Elementary. And what's on my paper is our first grade, we already have high class sizes, and we have had to split another class for over a month because they've not been able to keep a substitute in there. And a couple of times we had subs who accepted long term and after two days quit, walked away. Because I think a lot of people, and no fault of their own, truly don't realize what goes into being a teacher every day. And as a parent, since I have your ear, uh, my student, um, I'm sorry, my child is a senior at Armwood High School, and they have a college level math course, and they were thriving, and their teacher had to quit. She quit, she couldn't do it anymore. Pay us. Please, pay us. We need to stay, we wanna stay. You know, at a pivotal moment in her life now, She's virtual with no one to help. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Angela Frazier. I teach at Nelson Elementary School. I've been there for my entire teaching career. This is my 17th year. Um, at our school, the staff has echoed over and over the concern about not having our steps met. Um, and yet there's an increase in our workload. And that's not just because we have vacancies of which we have many at our school. Between trying to act as a social worker, trying to be the ESE teacher, and in some classes not having a para that's needed, um, it makes it much more difficult to have the gumption and the grit to get up every day and go in with a smile on our face for our kids um, and when we're being disrespected by not getting our steps. So um, please consider what all of us are saying tonight. Um, Because what's happening this year and in the last, without COVID, you're really at a pivotal spot right now where you have the opportunity to make an incredible difference, not just for the people who are in here wearing red, but for the thousands and thousands of kids in one of the largest counties or largest districts in this country. So I feel compelled to let you know that that's, that's what's motivating me and probably a lot of the other people here tonight. It's those kids. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Charles Stanback. I'm at Sly Middle Magnet. I'm the third person to come up here from my school to voice our concerns, so I'm just gonna keep it really short. We need our two steps. We need our two steps. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Dana Cook. I work, work at Riverview High School. Um, so today I'm voicing my concern that our classrooms are overstuffed with students. My eighth period is a FUSE class and I have 34 students. I don't care that I have a co-teacher who is wonderful. There's no way she and I can meet the needs of 34 children, many of whom have IEPs and 504s. Never mind the fact that at this point, if I add even one more desk to my room, I physically can't even walk to my students. At this point, my room is not built for this number of children. Please help us alleviate this problem by increasing our funding so that we can create more positions. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, Roger Marcellus from Blake High School. 
like Dana, we are also facing overcrowded classrooms. We've got some core classes with anywhere from 30 to 40 students, which I believe is in violation of the amendment that the Florida voters passed several years ago. In addition to that, we also have a shortage of ESE teachers. I have two uh, FUSE classes without a, uh, an ESC teacher, so I'm having to do that. And even though I've had some training as an ESC, um, I am not ESC certified. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. I'm Roberto Rosa from Tomlin Middle School in Plant City, and I am an ESC teacher. Um, our shortage of ESC teachers is pushing a heavy load on the other case managers, and uh, we're experiencing nearly 30 students uh, per caseload. I know other schools are experiencing way more, um, but that takes up a, a lot of time on top of having uh, the resource classes, the co-teach classes, um, planning for them. Uh, so just wanted you all to be aware. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Sandra Van Dyke. Um, I'm at Ezra Elementary, and I'm a uh, para there. Um, our issue at our school is that our AC is on the fritz again. And um, the smell of mold and oldness is unbearable when you walk in at, um, in the morning. Um, we have a shortage of uh, subs at our school too, and the ELL and the ESE staff is being pulled to cover these classes, and that means that the kids that they were supposed to service are not being serviced. And please give us our two steps. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, my name is Sue McCrossan from Esrig Elementary School. I have served this district for 28 years as an educator. I hold a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and I'm a twice renewed national board certified teacher. I am a professional educator. Despite what people say, you cannot take someone, assign them a mentor, and place them in a classroom and expect results. Ours is a highly skilled profession, and I venture to say you feel the same about yours. All teachers want is to be treated as professionals and paid accordingly. I am at the top of the pay scale, yet I continue to work multiple jobs to maintain my standard of living, modest as it is. Mr. Washington was my prior area director at two schools. He always said, you have to take care of your people. Please heed his words. Not with emails saying you're doing a great job. We already know that. <laughs> Not with supplements that are only a band-aid on a festering wound, being asked to do more and more without being compensated accordingly. I also ask that you look at district assets that could be liquidated in order to free up some funds. For example, selling the Rozak building and the ISC building. If that's not feasible, please look at other ways. We have sites with low enrollment. Why not shift some district staff to those schools? And if that still isn't feasible, then maybe the high-level district staff would like to pay, take a pay cut for a year to feel our pain without any supplemental income at all. Please do the right thing and support your teachers if we have continued to support you over and over again. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Missy Carl, and I teach at Grady Elementary School. And I would like to start with a little bit of history. Back in 2009, many of us teachers were told about a new model of teacher evaluation salary plan called Empowering Effective Teacher Initiative. Superintendent Ilya networked and campaigned for all Hillsborough County teachers to buy into this, and most of us did. Now fast forward to today. I would venture to say about 95% or more teachers are part of the salary system which involves steps. Last year, negotiations occurred with the district offering a one-step payment called a supplement. This is like a bonus. The proposal was to use ESSER funds, aka COVID funds, to pay for the supplement. 
ESSER funds are not designed for reoccurring expenses, especially for salary steps of teachers. The teachers voted in good faith to accept this proposal to help HCPS with the financial recovery plan in place. State takeover was a possibility and we partnered with you in this process and accepted the proposal. There was never a legal document signed that you would give us our correct step increase for the year. But there was verbal discord among negotiators that we would get our two steps this year. This didn't happen. Now you are asking us to accept another proposal with no legal guarantee of our salary steps being given for two years. This is not okay. Funding is available in the budget to pay for salaries and you are breaking an agreement for all of us that entered the Empowering Effective Teacher Initiative that began in 2009. We are now at impasse with the magistrate assigned to hear the case. It saddens me that we are now here, especially when ESSER funds should be used to recover from a pandemic, not to supplement salaries. Salaries are a budgeted item. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, everybody. My name is Emily Lee. I teach at Bernie Elementary in Plant City. If you can't tell by the increasing number of staff showing up at these meetings every month, things aren't going well in our schools for anyone. Our students are the ones that are suffering the most. Morale is lower than it's ever been before and still declining daily. Class sizes are too large to properly support students in their learning. Textbooks are still missing from many schools. Those that have been delivered have errors, typos, and ink smeared all over them. Because morale is so low, staffing is also low. We're so short on teachers and support staff, there aren't permanent teachers or paras for many, count, many classes across the county and multiple subject areas. National data was released showing us Hillsborough County is a bright spot. All the praises that have been sung in the news and on social media about HCPS being one of the few districts to hold scores and not drop by the top administration has been insulting. For the past two years, we have taught like our hair was on fire, just like our superintendent requested when he got here. The teachers and school staff have made that national news happen. Through their dedication and hard work, even though these have been the most trying times for education in the history of our country. It's baffling to me that our praises and hard work are recognized by words and disingenuous thank yous. Empty appreciation can't pay mortgages or rent. Empty appreciation can't put food on our tables or gas in our cars to get to work. The crowds of teachers here at these meetings might seem small compared to the amount of teachers that would come if they weren't working second and third jobs just to be able to support their family. Appreciation hasn't even been enough to keep our classrooms and schools fully staffed. We have higher vacancies than ever and more are in line to leave the classroom and this district as we speak. So my question that requires the district to do some serious looking ahead and critical thinking is, what will the data look like at the end of this year? What will it look like when classes are covered all year by any warm body or by kids split randomly to rooms in different grade levels than their own? What will it look like when the large numbers of your employees, teachers, bus drivers, custodians, secretaries, nutritional specialists continue to leave to be able to have a chance at providing their families. We have a published pay scale that includes steps each year. We deserve to be paid for the years that we've worked. The teacher working conditions are our student learning conditions. And spoiler alert, the outlook is very, very bleak. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is David Wagner and I teach at Alonzo High School. This is my first year in Hillsborough County. I taught in Broward County last year and in the St. Mary's County Public Schools in Maryland for five years before that. My story is a little bit different than many of my colleagues, but I think you'll recognize some common themes. Alonzo is the best school that I've taught at, and I see why people say that it's the best high school in Hillsborough County. I'm fortunate to work with outstanding colleagues, and the administrators are generally supportive. The losing three assistant principals and having to replace them in the last three months has created noticeable problems. The kids are great, and I look forward to teaching them every day. Hillsborough County Public Schools provides more curriculum support than the places I've taught previously. The places where I previously taught had much less unified approaches to curriculum, and the way Hillsborough approaches it is a strength. Although my students' music theory and piano workbooks didn't arrive at Alonzo until the second week of the second quarter, 
The support that I've received from the district music office as a new teacher to Hillsborough has been exceptional, though that support was stretched pretty thin when supervisors had to be placed in classrooms to plug the teacher shortages at the beginning of the year. Be careful not to pat yourself too hard on the back about having solved that shortage because it hasn't been solved. Teachers are not staying because they can't afford to live on the salaries you are paying. I teach two orchestras, chorus, two keyboard classes, and one section of special education music. Additionally, I teach an after-school orchestra group one day a week and sponsor the Triumph Music Honor Society as a club. I usually spend between 55 and 60 hours per week teaching and planning for my classes and for Tri-M, including Saturday mornings and sometimes much more time than that on the weekends. You will note that the contract, the terms of which you currently can't be bothered to meet, pays us for 40 hours. For all of that work, Hillsborough County Public Schools will pay me $52,449.62 this year. The only reason that that number is above $50,000 at all is that I receive about $4,000 annually in stipends for being a high school chorus and orchestra director. Most of my colleagues with similar experience who are working similar hours to teach their students and prepare thoroughly are still paid $47,501 for the year. Last year, Broward County paid me $2,500 for my master's degree. Hillsborough County pays nothing for advanced degrees. Last year, Broward County paid me $1,700 for sponsoring a club in addition to my regular teaching load. Hillsborough County pays nothing for that, and teachers who sponsor clubs are expected to do so on a voluntary basis. Do you understand why you're not attracting and retaining teachers? <laughs> People can't afford to work here on the salaries you're paying. Florida's lack of a state income tax doesn't make up the difference compared to what other states pay, and the time when you could claim cost of living in Florida is lower is long past. When was the last time that any of you worked for $50,000 or less for the year? Or raised a family on that? Or raised a family on $30,000 or less like many of our support staff have to? What would you or your children have to give up to live or raise a family on that salary? Would you want to give those things up? Pay your school teachers thank, and staff livable salaries. Thank you salaries. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Kathleen Dunkelberger. I work at Northwest Elementary School. I'm a fourth grade math and science teacher. So I'm gonna give a little mini la math lesson. Some of my fellow teachers actually asked me to come up here because they really like how simplified I made my explanation of, of what I feel is going on and the impact to my family. And I am not alone in this. I am the only one person speaking for one person, but my story is just like everybody else's. Here's my math lesson. Because of record high inflation for the past, in the last 40 years, we've had record high inflation. My grocery bill for my son, my veteran husband, and myself has gone from $600 a month to over $1,200 a month. That's just for groceries. My property taxes, because of record high housing prices in Tampa, my property taxes went from $2,000 a year to $7,000 a year. They more than tripled. My teacher salary, take home pay, is less than $3,000 a month. That's two and a half months salary just for my property taxes now. And I didn't move, am I gonna have to? Am I gonna have to get a smaller house in, a, in not a nice neighborhood in order for me to continue to be a teacher? To me, these steps are critical to survive and continue being there for the kids. What I feel that we are negotiating at impasse is not a raise. We are negotiating, negotiating out of a salary cut during record high inflation and record high prices on the housing market. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Sam Weiss. I'm a teacher at Brayden High School, and I'm not going to talk about anything that hasn't been said already other than three or four major issues that I've seen at my school that include air conditioning, class sizes, teacher morale, and the treatment of students who are learning English as a second language. The Brandon, the Brandon High School AC unit was affected by lightning strike on August 19th. For several weeks thereafter, it stayed at 83 degrees in my classroom, causing me to have an asthma attack and leave school early. When it was fixed, it stayed at 68 degrees all day, every day, and this was the case until a month ago when the district finally sent people out to work on it, and it has now been at a comfortable temperature. Why did they take so long to 
be fixed if that was something that the district has invested in. I have many colleagues who are complaining about various class sizes, two in particular that are non-fused classes that are six over capacity with 31 students. There are teachers complaining about teacher morale who have been working with the district since 2011 and feel that they are overworked on a daily basis. And, and this teacher felt survivor's guilt for almost having to take a leave of absence to deal with her mental health to be a positive role model for her children. Many friends are still teaching. Her greatest concern is that her children won't have any of these great teachers left because they're all leaving because they're being overworked. We have to bring back respect, basic care, and realistic work expectations for, education, for educators to be able to thrive rather than survive. And for our students who are learning English as a second language, they are a vast majority of our student population. But how are they going to be able to graduate with such demanding requirements for graduation? What is the board doing to address this huge inequity between English speakers and non-English speakers? A concern that our school has is the huge workload for ESOL teachers that have three or more preps. They're required to hold a large number of yearly meetings and to prep for the yearly WIDA testing. What is the board doing to address the need for more in-class support in this vulnerable membership of our school? Our numbers reflect the various school grades and ESSA requirements, and yet our students continue to experience a lack of support to meet the stringent graduation requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, board. Have a uh, slightly different perspective that I want to share. Um, just wanted to clarify some inaccurate information that was shared on the news, in my opinion. Um, and it's regarding reopening of schools. Um, it was mentioned that um, our district, we excelled so well, which we, in fact, did. But I just wanted to clarify that um, reopening of schools does not guarantee student achievement. Um, reopening of schools does not impact student achievement. Hundreds of schools were opened within our state and thousands in our nation. The actual impact of student achievement is tied to student-teacher relationship. The impact of teacher-parent relationship. The impact of teacher caretaker relationship, the impact of teacher ESC specialist relationship, the impact of teacher and subject area leader relationship, the impact of highly effective teachers, paraprofessionals, school counselors, social workers, assistant principals, and principals are factors that allowed our fourth grade students to excel, not reopening schools. And I want to congratulate all of my peers, all of the colleagues and the fourth grade teachers and staff throughout the district on that high achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. tough act to follow. Good evening. My name is Christina Donnelly, and I am representing Lithia Springs Elementary. Unfortunately, not many of my colleagues were able to join me tonight due to the fact that they don't have the time and the energy to take on one more cause. Many teachers at our school are at the breaking point between the unrealistic expectations and the demands of this profession. The reality is the teachers are no longer respected. We are being asked to do more and more every day, yet are constantly being criticized that we are not doing enough. We are expected to meet the needs of our students, our families, our administration, the district. However, our needs are continuously ignored time and time again. Teaching used to be a profession that you could be proud of. Now we seem to be a scapegoat for all the things that are wrong with public education today. Our experience, our knowledge, our opinions, they don't matter anymore. According to our governor, anybody can be a teacher. So I would like, whoever, anybody out there, public that is watching, I would love for you to come in and see what a teacher does every day, what the reality of being a public school teacher is. 
We are discouraged. We are angry. We are exhausted. And as much as we love our jobs, which all of us do, or we wouldn't be here, there's a breaking point. The sacrifices that we are making to do our jobs well are not worth our well-being nor that of our families and that they're suffering. I urge you to listen. Take action before it's too late. Mrs. Snively made a comment as she was wrapping up her speech, and she said, the one thing you all have in common is that you want to do the right thing. So do it. Take care of your teachers. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I am Carissa Denica. Um, I'm also the site rep for Gaither High School, other than just the squeaky wheel. Um, I, uh, I asked my members what the biggest issues were at our school. Overwhelmingly, it was student management, supervision, and accountability. Management of students is the most common issue. Discipline is not done effectively. And it's not because our APs aren't doing anything. There's too few of them, and they don't have the ability to actually have real consequences. Something must change. If students are only at school for social reasons, then you end up with consistent tardies, you end up with skipping, you end up with fights, and you end up with disrespect. If students don't want to be in school, let's make a program that removes them from disrupting other students' education. Supervision at my school is impossible. The architect certainly wasn't worried about shooters. Students roam the halls, causing disruptions. They leave during lunchtime to go to the local Chick-fil-A and, uh, and Bob Evans and Taco Bell. Come, I, anybody, come to our school without telling anybody, don't tell anybody, and see around lunchtime and see the kids leaving in drone and, 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 and mass, uh, leaving campus and there aren't enough people to do anything about it. Come knock on a door, have a student open the door for you because there's no fence in front of our school, although there are at other schools. <coughs> Finally, teachers are being held accountable for keeping learning in our classrooms, but there isn't accountability for students. Some students are sitting in classes and doing nothing, and not because there isn't a teacher. There are those too, but because they refuse to do anything. When someone comes in and sees that student doing nothing, what ends up happening is it's our fault. It's my fault that that student made a choice. We are expected to entertain, we're expected to babysit, and we're expected to somehow fit teaching in in there, but the students have no real accountability for their actions. What this leads to is teacher burnout, and we are seeing that. Finally, at my school, what I would like you to, to look at, and maybe this is a district issue, I'd like you to look at what proportion of students have virtual placeholders. Maybe this is a this year issue, but what's really happening is that there are way more students that have uh, virtual placeholders, and I don't think they actually have a virtual class that they are being placed into. That's money out of our, our pocket. That's going to Florida Virtual or nowhere. Um, additionally, my husband is amazing. He left here to go to... Uh, to take my kid to swim class after leaving here because he felt it was that important. And my kids aren't gonna be teachers. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Teagarden. I teach second grade at Heritage Elementary. This is my eighth year here in the district and I currently make the same amount as a first year teacher unless if you take into account the ridiculously priced 2BPI health insurance plan that I pay for my family, the same 2BPI plan that the district tri quietly tried to get rid of last summer at the expense of our most committed family employees. But I digress, I'm not here to talk about money problems tonight, even though that is a leading cause of teachers leaving this district. I'm here to tell you about some of the struggles that we face daily at Heritage Elementary, and I wanna preface this whole conversation by saying I love my school, I love my students, I love the teachers I work with, I love my admin. I, I am so connected to that school, I love it. We have done everything we can to make our school beautiful and as clean as possible, but there are things that are out of our control and subpar working conditions that we are in daily with little complaint. Heritage Elementary is only 19 years old, yet it is evident when it has rained outside because many of the classroom's wall paint starts bubbling and peeling after each rain. 
There is an entire wing of our school that leaks every single time it rains. And I'm sure you can imagine what it looks like inside the walls with all that moisture. Although I've never looked inside the walls or vents myself, I've definitely experienced mold allergy symptoms every single August when we go back to school. There is visible black mold on the ceiling tiles in our media center that comes right back each time they get replaced because the underlying problem never ever gets fixed. Our school works very hard to plan and facilitate school beautification days, mural paint painting clubs with students, and community mural projects at various school festivals. But murals and pretty paint can only cover up mold stains so much. My classroom specifically has been fighting a losing battle with roaches recently. Our classroom has had, my classroom has had multiple MRs submitted and pest control comes to spray once in a while. And today when I opened up my drawer to take my bag out to come here, a roach scurried across my purse. And cherry on top of that situation, we're all out of roach traps at Heritage. In addition to all of the infrastructure problems we have, our school has had major issues with new Evolve laptops that we've received over the past year. I personally have had eight of my 15 laptops break. These laptops are brand new without a scratch and some still have the protective plastic coatings and yet if you look at them too hard, the sound goes out rendering the entire device completely useless for second grade. These issues are marked as a known issue for the model and yet they disappear into some repair process and never to return. We continue to excel in spite of all of this and we would really, we don't, we don't need to appreciate it. We deserve it. We deserve the Thank steps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello. Good evening. My name is Rebecca Bohr, and I am a reading teacher at Riverview High School. Um, I've been there, uh, well, I've been in the district for seven years. Um, so every school board meeting seems to approve purchasing of new programs. Um, you recently approved the purchase of a program called Chalk Talk to help our struggling juniors and seniors meet their ELA graduation requirement. To implement this program, the teachers need training. Training should occur on a professional development day before the start of the school year. <clears throat> Instead, this training needs to occur ASAP. Um, so subs have been summoned and will be paid and students will miss a day of instructions so that, so that teachers can gather from across the district to learn the latest program. Last time I spoke to you, I complained about another program. Uh, you had recently purchased Language Live. It took the entire first quarter to get that working for me and my students. Um, but that's what happens with new programs. They don't work very well. Um, I don't think Language Live is a bad program or that my students shouldn't be using it, but this new program doesn't seem that different from the old program, Brightfish. And we aren't a one-to-one -one device school, so trying to get students to complete 40 minutes a week of anything requiring a computer requires I check out a laptop cart through Microsoft Forms after a request has been approved through Teams. I'm sure the new Chalk Talk program is great and it will offer much more than Khan Academy or Achieve 3000. Um, I really liked Common Lit. However, the access through Clever has been taken away, so I can't use that one anymore. Um, I don't think Synergy was a necessary purchase if schools are able to pull grades directly from Canvas for progress reports, but I also didn't understand why we had to go back and enter grades on Edspy after we transferred transitioned to Canvas. Um, why is it that EdConnect just won't connect? <laughs> um, I'm sorry if I've confused any of you with all these different programs. Um, I also have struggled to keeping them straight. Um, you can imagine the confusion of all the long-term subs who are asked to cover one of the many vacancies in our district on any given day. Um, again, none of these programs are necessarily bad, um, but there are too many and too many changes too often. <laughs> and if you're willing to spend money on anything, Please make it teacher salaries. <laughs> um, I also have a request. Um, so I would like for you guys to fund the opportunity for all juniors and seniors to take both an ACT and an SAT each semester. 
Okay? Um, per, and I would like for that opportunity to be provided on a school day, preferably on a day already dedicated to testing, such as the PSAT day. I do not understand why we insist our juniors needing that graduation requirement take a PSAT which doesn't count and pay us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Um, hello, it is a little uncomfortable being here, but I definitely wanted to be someone who I stand with the teachers, I stand with our kids, I stand with our schools. Um, education is what's going to take our kids somewhere. And I'm, uh, this is my eighth year at Potter Elementary, I've only been at Potter. It is a great place to be, but it's a great place be to be because of the people. It's the people who make it that. It's not easy. Our kids come, I was at the tail end of the five year F run, and I still have goosebumps thinking about when we pushed it and made that C. We did that with help from the district. And then the next year, the district left, of course. But we, we felt empowered. Our kids did it. And that's a huge thing for our kids at our school to do. Um, this year, again, being my eighth year, I am now VE. Our school's changing again. Um, I have a couple of colleagues with me. Our kids are, are struggling, not academic, like they are academically, but they are coming with so much baggage now that they didn't have like the last four years. They are drowning. We're trying to support them. We, they walk through the door and we are told today too at a staff meeting, love our principal. She's amazing. She's filling in in a fifth grade vacancy. She teaches part of the day. The AP teaches part of the day. We have resource teachers who come in and teach it as well. But we're told, well, as best as you can, stay on schedule. If you're behind schedule, try to get back on schedule. You know, I'm trying to deal with kids who are, have already moved to schools this year. You know, there's, it's just, it's a lot. So then when we talk about teachers, you take, it's dedicated people who stay. People who really genuinely care, but it's getting harder. Um, the things that my teachers had to say was at our school, um, one of the teachers who's, she's been a rock, our incentives for being a transformation school, those are disappearing. So why are we gonna take on the trauma from our kids and from our parents? I, one of my other colleagues was gonna come tonight, but he said, you know, I'm so tired. I'm trying to get things ready for progress reports. And I, I had to kind of intervene between two feuding parents. And we shouldn't have to do that. Um, he should be able to come here and represent his, um, his school and his kids. We also have too many uh, class splits. Today, again, we had it in first, our first grade. We have, they have about 20 kids in each class. They had to take six extra kids today because one of their colleagues ended up having to leave by ambulance because she had a massive migraine that seemed like a mini stroke. It's just, it's too emotionally too much for teachers anymore. They're struggling financially with the lack of the transformation pay delay. Usually we would get that in you know October, November, and then it was a little bit in every check. It's not that anymore. So please just, again, it's about respect. It's about uh, what we need so that we can be there and show up for our kids. Thank you very much. Good evening, board members, Aaron Zions, Pierce Middle School, a former CTA board member, FEA governance member. I'm pleased to receive the emails and see in TV that we are doing so well that we are ranked number one in fourth grade, uh, reading to math, three in eighth grade, and in, uh, and in simple business terms, it's respect the people that work for you, which means you're going to honor the contract. They're not, it, it is a contract based upon years of service, not on steps, years of service means how many years have you been here? How many years have I been servicing you? 21. 21 at the same school and inner city school, never less than a C. Always love to say that because you know, it's tough to work in some of those schools. People here have been telling you all day long. I've sat on contract negotiations. I was there when we said, hey, we only have 3% reserves. We can't go below 3% reserves. All right, we'll work with you. We have 11% reserves, about $136 million. The charge to go to, well, well, approximately, if I remember the numbers correctly, may be close to $100 million, whatever it is. The charge to go and pay this pay rate is really $26 million, which you said you pay. But here's the thing that disrespects the teachers. Oh, but we won't make it your service years. They want their service years. I'm retiring. 
It's not my money anymore. I'm going to finish my years here and I'm retiring. But they're still going to be here. And I'm inspired by a lot of them. But what we do to our teachers is not inspiring. Take Renaissance pay. Well, we're going to pay you a little bit in November. It used to be October. And a little bit in May. Well, what else I going to do for Christmas presents? Oh, yeah. That's the money in May. I guess we'll have Christmas in May this year. I mean, that's where our teachers are. I'm fortunate. I'm very fortunate. I'm blessed. But I sit here with teachers that struggle every day. And it's not fair. And you guys need to correct it. And you have the power to. That was a joke coming to the teachers and say, let's just give you a bonus. We'll give you one, but not two. In business, you, you'd have what happened uh, in China. They all walked out of Apple. We're not doing this two weeks uh, surrender thing anymore. They, you're not going to have it. Look at where you're at. 900 teachers you need. 150 bus drivers. We have buses that, never, that get to school so late and come so late. Roger and I didn't get here until 6 o'clock today, having to stay on duty. And we want to participate. And by the way, if you want to respect me, I'd like to be able to come to the meetings and hear the whole meeting. I'm a middle school teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, everyone. Angela Colinello here. Uh, Ms. Vaughn, I heard you were getting paper for a lot of people, so I do want to say thank you for that. It's much appreciated. I'm very happy to see all of the faces here, and I want to ask you, you have your teachers here, your workforce. Do you feel the desperation? You can feel it in the room. You can see it. You can hear it. I walked in here, and I was amazed. It just overcame me with how much desperation I feel out of everyone here. Um, I'm bringing my quotes with you from me um, from the last time that I heard. Also, I took some time. I was probably late because I was, as a, an effective teacher, reflecting on myself from the last couple times I spoke with everyone here, and I sounded so mousy and small, I couldn't believe it. So I'm trying to assert myself and make sure that I am heard for my people. I'm sharing some quotes with you from the last time. I heard a third grader say, that's why I don't want to become a teacher. I heard a fifth grade teacher say, I just don't want to teach anymore. I just don't want to do this. I heard another third grade teacher through the tears in the morning. I'm so overwhelmed. I just don't want to be here. Just crying. Third year here. Um, reading my little Papa John's paper, for the sacrifice that you make here is a free pizza. It's being recognized, the suffering, the desperation, the overwork, everything. We're all doing the work of four or five people. It's very, very exhausting. Another quote today from another teacher. I want to talk to you. I'm just so confused. I don't understand who decided on these all unannounced observations. I'm so worried about this VAM score. I don't even know like what I'm supposed to be doing or who decided this and what it's so subjective. What if that person doesn't like me? Da da da. Like there's so much pressure. And there's so as everyone here has said, like there is so the morale and the worry and the concern of every single teacher just walking down the halls. You see it in the faces, you hear it in the kids. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to go on and talk about the budget and how we spoke about whether it was the COVID budget or regular budget and how teacher um, pay cannot be part of the budget, teacher increases. I need to sit here and remind you, please listen. Teachers are the budget. Without the teachers, without the students, there is no school board. We don't have a district. We are the budget. We are the workforce. Teachers, safe buildings, some curriculum, children, the budget. And then sprinkle in some coaches, some people, other staff. I need you to please understand that we are here still begging, still desperate, and please, please start taking care of our people. Thank you all. Thank you. Our final speaker this evening. Thank you. Good evening to our elected school board members and our current superintendent. Heidi Glick from Alonzo High School, senior rep and, school and member of the HCTA board. 
The first thing I'd like to do tonight is apologize. It was rather heavy handed in my speech the last time I was here. I actually hit the podium. I was very upset by some of the comments that had been made earlier and I let it affect me and for that I am sorry. I'm actually here tonight to say thank you. I want to thank you for letting all of the teachers who have signed up to speak, speak, and for the full three minutes. We all really, really appreciate that. I think it's almost seven o'clock right now. I want to thank you for the things that I have learned over the past few months. I learned that Kirkland is not really a brand. It is actually Costco's requirement that companies that do business with, with them create a certain number of the same exact product with the Kirkland label. So Kirkland toilet paper is Charmin toilet paper. Toilet paper. I learned that some store brands are just as good as the name brand. I learned that Dr. Thunder is almost as good as Dr. Pepper. I learned that some generic drugs do work as well as the others, but unfortunately I learned that some do not, but I'm okay now. I learned that Suave does not really do what others do for less as they claim. I learned that even though I have not received a raise and my salary is the same, I have actually received a pay cut as the district's medical has increased and actually prices for everything else has increased. I learned that I do not have a hard corner for safety because I need desks for my students. I learned to reduce the number of assignments I have given in the past because I cannot get them graded in a timely fashion due to the number of students in my classes. I learned that even though supportive administrators ask for things to help us, the ones in the actual classrooms, they have also been turned down as well. I learned that my students are as frustrated as we are with the crowded classrooms. I learned that students are frustrated for their teachers. I learned that a first year adjunct at HCC makes more money per hour than a teacher at the top of our scale. I learned that old classroom decorations will just have to do. I learned that more responsibilities does not equal more respect, nor does it equal more pay. I learned that five EAP visits are not enough. I learned that hoping kids are absent so there are enough chairs for everyone in the room is not nice, but unfortunately necessary. I wanted to thank you for encouraging everyone who might be eligible for DROP to look into it and to enroll if they were able. They were able. I want to thank you for encouraging our young teachers to update their resumes and to look for outside employment so that they can live, have a livable wage and get the money they deserve. And I want to thank you for allowing our administrators to do the same. So all in all, we have learned quite a few things in the last few months, at least working here in Hillsborough County. And one last thing, my mother taught me when I was very young to never say I'm sorry, because it doesn't mean anything. She said, change your behavior. Please stop saying you respect us. Please stop saying you appreciate us. Change your behavior and prove it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a short recess. Okay, we're going to go ahead and take like a five-minute recess so that way everybody can clear out. Thank you, all of you, for coming. Thank you for, for speaking, and thank you for being here. We'll just take a short recess.
Okay, thank you, board members. We'll go ahead and continue. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. We'll go ahead and move to the consent agenda. I need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion by Member Gray, and I have a second by Member Washington. Please vote when your lights appear. We're voting on the consent agenda. And it passes unanimously. The following items will now be heard. C-103, C-301, C-701, C-703, C-704, C-706, C-711, C-1001, and C-1002. Go ahead and start with 103, which is a sole source uh, paper education company incorporated for the purchase of unlimited chat-based tutoring for students in grades 6 through 12. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, Mr. the Chair, this is an opportunity for us to continue our partnership with Paper Education. You know, when we started, you know, a year and a half ago, trying to find solutions to be able to help students who were out for COVID and needed us to move to make, make certain that instructional momentum continued, we were trying to find solutions not only for elementary but for secondary as well. And while elementary, we stood up a, a handful of teachers to be able to uh, make available to our students who are sick, our students who are out, to make certain that, that learning was continuous to help them. We also identified a, a platform and a corporation that would provide 24-7 tutoring to grades uh, 6 through 12. With that process, we know that uh, over that year, we served close to 16,000 students, over 47,000 activities, and students from 105 schools. Uh, we know that that's an opportunity for us to really continue to focus on and grow to expand as a number of our teachers, uh, you know, will le leverage this current platform in order to, to take care of any major issues that students had to learn through in an effort to strengthen their knowledge in, in the core content or in standards being taught. In the same process, we look at this year, we've had over 4,500 students that are actively engaged since the beginning of the school year and around 9,125 activities in 92 uh, schools, students from 92 schools have leveraged this platform. Uh, the, you know, right now we do have a marketing plan that uh, we put in the backup and have conversation to be able to show that we have actively are engaging our stakeholders, pr uh, providing ongoing professional development if approved to teachers. We will focus on making certain that we continue to extend this with our principals within our principal meetings and make this a viable solution for our students as we move, as we move forward. Uh, tonight, the, the first uh, phase is, from the financial perspective is that we will be using SAI dollars to cover it and then transition it to ESSER ESSER $2, which is all about supplemental program grant funding, which is unique to be able to use on extended learning and to be able to address the achievement gap. And it's an isolated categorical fund to be able to use and leverage this process. Um, at this time, I want to transition to Mr. Connor to really speak more about this initiative and how we continue to leverage it and use it at, if approved this evening. Good evening, board. Thank you so much. I know I've had a lot of personal conversation with each of you in terms of this particular agenda item. Um, and you rightfully have come with some concerns around just utilizations and the amount that we are that we our original contract was and continuing it into this year. And so we went to this um, back to the company and we wanted to make sure that we were maximizing every opportunity to reduce the contract and we were successfully able to negotiate down from $27 per student to 12, uh, 12 dollars and some change. And so that was a significant, um, um, agreement or proposal for as we move into this year because the company also realized that there is more to do in terms of really marketing to get more students involved. We need uh, exposure and as we've done an analysis of this and as we determine what our plan is to really increase this, I really think it comes down to promotion with our teachers and getting them to really understand the value and how to leverage this with their students. And so since then, in, in, in about February, we were able to secure from paper, the company, an actual dedicated customer success manager, someone who lives right here in Hillsborough County, who is dedicated to really helping market it and uh, provide training and to do all the necessary components so that we can see an increase in usage. 
And since that time, we have done things such as posters in every school. They've actually put up six billboards across the county. They did TV commercials in the month of March to start promoting this. In the summer, and we know that the usage obviously declines in the summer, but we leveraged every, every one of our summer learning opportunities, our bridge camps at high school and middle school, to really educate our students on what the program was about, which is great when you think of an eighth grader moving to high school in ninth grade and they're being oriented to their new classrooms and their new, their new environment and understanding some of these resources that are at their disposal if they hadn't seen them before. We have really made a presence in some of the community events such as the Back to School Bash put on by uh, Mr. Thaddeus Bullard. We, we're, they had a presence out there and other uh, community events as well. They've been invited to all of our principal meetings to ensure that our principals understand. We actually did survey our principals and our principals um, the 71 out of 80 some odd principals that responded to that, we had a very high return rate. We had 87% of our principals say this is a product that we want to continue to use for our students. Another part of that survey was what else could we do to help promote that? And, and that included social media posts. Uh, and what was rated really highly was teacher development, making sure teachers understood how they could leverage this program. So that's where we're going to be focusing as we move in to this, the remainder of this, uh, our progress into the new agreement that we have. So the impact team uh, is going to be working to host a professional development session for teachers at every one of our sites. We feel that that will be very helpful in ensuring uh, uh, that they have the awareness of what the services are there. Also, we're going to be hosting what are called paper days, which is going to help students understand uh, how they can use and leverage the platform at school and at home. Every school is going to have identify a paper trailblazer or champion, in other words, that will be identified at the school who's going to be able to share resources, be able to share the tips and tricks at their school site. So every school will have that person that they can connect with on their site. We're also going to continue to leverage our communications department, make sure that parents understand when paper is putting webinars out that they're there, they're in English, they're in Spanish, different languages, making sure that that information is shared on a biweekly basis. And so those are just some of the things because I know that is the concern is if we're going to make an investment like this, we want to see students leveraging this as much as possible. And we know we got to do better. Uh, we felt like in the first year of an implementation, which typically is, is not easy, and especially during the COVID and, and all the things, the quarantines and all the things that we were dealing with, that we didn't see the usage that we would have liked. But we did see usage and we do see teachers um, that are using this product and we're seeing that's where the success is and the increase in usage is when teachers understand it, know how to leverage it, their students in turn are leveraging it. So that's where we're going to focus our efforts a lot is on informing teachers and getting them to understand that product. Thank you very much. I need a motion a second to approve item C-103. I have a motion by Member Hahn. I have a second by Member Washington. Member Gray, Member Vaughn, Member Snively and I pulled this item. So we can go ahead and get started if you want to go ahead and, and comments. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Connor, for explaining the, uh, the pros on this um, uh, paper education uh, company. The question I have, um, and, and you hit upon it briefly on the surveys, but what are the learning benefits that we can um, absolutely do a data check in terms of learning loss? Do we have any, any numbers that we can capture, um, any increase in the reading scores, anything that would measure, show measurement? Well, it, we're trying, you know, it's very hard to draw a direct line to the 24-7 tutoring to achievement. But what we have seen, as noted in a lot of our, our data recently released and what we're seeing in our progress monitoring data, is that we're seeing that we are mitigating learning loss as compared to other school districts. So when you look across and you're seeing school districts seeing some significant declines as a result of the last two and a half years, and Hillsboro is maintaining and sometimes exceeding, this is one of those strategies in a multitude, right? We know that teachers are really the, the key component in that. 
But there are other things too, such as providing an access to 24 7 tutoring that students can leverage. We've talked extensively with paper about how can we correlate specific usage with the program to specific outcomes and state data and they're working through that process with us and want to and want to work with us specifically to determine how we can do that better so that we can create that straight line mm -hmm. in terms of that correlation so that's more to come on that but you know what i see in in terms of all the resources available it's not one thing that does it it's a culmination of all of those things that keep hillsborough where we're at in, academically well, I mean, on a pragmatic side, I look at it uh, in two positive ways. Number one, uh, with the uh, coming about of more and more technology, uh, with the students, students use technology. This is something that is student friendly. Um, and if the teachers are supporting it, which I'm going to ask, I know the principals uh, seem to be supporting, but how about our teachers? Anecdotal type of comments made, anything of that nature that, that you yeah, hear? Yes, so we do get we do get anecdotal data actually um, as they engage into the program. Um, they may be presented with a survey, and we do get some anecdotal feedback from them. I don't have any quantitative data, but we've got plenty of testimonials of how this has been very successful and how teachers uh, perceive this program, uh, which I did provide to the board this afternoon. So I won't read them all, but there definitely there's some very positive feedback from our teachers in terms of usage. Okay, and my, at my last question, uh, Mr. Connor, is um, when we deal with the high needs children, um, and perhaps even a lack of technology in their hands. Um, do we see that there's more usage from our high need students versus uh, those who perhaps are in programs like ACE or Cambridge, et cetera? Is there any type of different usage uh, trends that you see? So when you look at school, school by school, and, and really where I, again, I go back to the point of when teachers understand the value of it and understand how to leverage it, that's where you're gonna see increased usage. So in some schools, we have extremely high usage, and that's where teachers really have found that. In some schools, we have not. And when you look at across all of our schools and you look at our, our different districts, um, there is always going to be some some impact, obviously, with your high SES schools if they have lack if they do lack some of that technology. So what we do, what we what we're planning to do is work with, especially in our transformation network, of how can we connect those technology resources from from school to the home. So is there an opportunity if you're one to one and there's and a student can check out a device, things of that nature, being creative to kind of close that digital divide as much as possible for students in need, that's what we're going to continue to look at uh, so that we don't see those type of negative impacts. Yeah, and I'm going to, I'm going to support this item and uh, because in my mind the learning loss is so severe that if we can make progress with that and make more and more, I don't want to say the word necessarily dense, but, but it's so critical that we address that. And this is, seems to be a, a cost-effective way. So um, I, uh, I will support this item. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Vaughn? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Connor, I appreciate you um, acting on that survey per my request because it's always important for me um, to understand what our schools actually want when we're making decisions from the dais. I did not get the comments I asked you for when we spoke earlier today. Did you email those? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay, because I would have liked to have those and I didn't get those because I think those are telling. Um, so I have questions. One, we had someone speak about the procurement process. What was the procurement process on this? Uh, it was advertised as a sole source. Meaning that we didn't offer other people an opportunity to bid on this at all? It was not done through an RFP. It was done through sole source. What would be the reasoning behind that? They uh, Their programs offer uh, very specific um, sole source features. I see. Um, the other concern that I have is I appreciate one making the connection that regardless of whether it's a fantastic platform or program, the key lies with how much our teachers actually utilize that and making the connection to the human capital that programs and platforms can't replace our teachers. And I appreciate that 
per the survey, one thing that we identified is support and re-implementing it and making sure that we have a plan because I know that we gleam that from the survey. My concern is we had several teachers speak tonight that they're overwhelmed with professional development, that every single time we buy a new computer program and we talk about the benefits of it and we talk about the professional development, which these days really accumulates to teachers self-teaching themselves through videos or webinars. It's not like we have people in our schools who are training our teachers. It's more time when they're talking about already being overworked and tired and exhausted and learning a new curriculum and a new test testing standard and a new evaluation form and all the other things when they talk about changes. When we talk about how much we're going to push this on them and ask for professional development, what I hear is that equates to more work to our teachers who are already drowning in work. So that is a concern for me. Um, so I want to know your feedback on that. Um, and my final comment is it's really hard and I know that we talk about this consistently that we have different categories of money and that the money that we spend on computer programs or different things is categorical and that can't be used for teacher salaries per se but it's incredibly hard for me to continue to support these items when teachers spoke this week because I got paper for them because there's not enough paper in our schools. There's not toners in our schools. There's not the basic needs that we have in a plethora of in our schools. I'll get back in the queue. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Oh, I do? Oh, I have 30 seconds. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's, it's increasingly hard for me to wrap my brain, even though it's not money that we necessarily can equate to paying our teachers, that we're prioritizing spending money on a, you know, a platform which hopefully helps with learning loss when we don't have the basic needs in our school. And maybe that's just miscommunication. Maybe that th there is money available for that. But the fact that we continually have teachers talking about that is problematic for me. And I will get back in the queue this time. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Superintendent Davis, you wanted to comment? Yes, ma'am, and I'll transition to Mr. Connor. First and foremost, anything that our, our schools need for the essentials, the, the that money has already been budgeted and ready to go. Our leaders just need to signify what they need. And everyone in this here this evening and regional superintendents, and we will help and provide ongoing supports as needed, whether that's paper, whether that's toner. Um, right now, the only thing that we see related to the overarching needs are the STEM scopes, which we cannot control. We ordered this material back in March, and they had the numbers in April. So related to the, uh, you know, where we are, and there's one grade level specifically that needs their student notebooks, you know, we will provide anything to be able to help and assist to make certain that student, that teachers do not come out of their pockets. We just need to know. We need to know if there's areas of, of issues or concerns so that we can continue to make certain we fill those voids. As it relates to professional development, that's the way we continue to learn and grow. And I know that may, it may be exhausting, but, you know, professional development has to happen so we're not staying and remaining stagnant. But at the same token, we always should be surveying uh, our teachers. Our, it's the same way we survey principals to determine what and reflect whether or not that professional development has been one that's been, uh, you know, uh, uh, valuable of time, connected to the overarching objectives, and really beneficial for us to be able to move forward. As an organization and an instruction, we have revolutionized our industry. industry. We have got to continue to make certain we push, you know, ball down the road and continue to progress, but at the same time, understand and recognize where our workforce is and to be able to be, um, you know, uh, very sensitive to that p continued process. Mr. Connor, you want to address anything related to, to PD or in needs for this initiative? Yeah, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right, Ms. Vaughn, in terms of just overwhelming our teachers with another thing. And this is something I think we can leverage professional development in very bite-sized pieces through their already existing structures like their common planning, their uh, PLCs, where this dedicated success manager who will dedicate themselves at that site for that entire day or multiple days to get in and work with grade levels or, or individual teachers who are interested in very bite-sized manageable pieces. So they're not sitting drudgery, you know, through a PowerPoint, like this is something that's powerful, it's hands-on, and they get it and get out and make it, make it quick for teachers. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, Member Snively. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm glad that they're, you're, you're putting together a strategic marketing plan or they're helping to, to do that. I don't know that there's a whole lot of professional development necessary for paper as much as promotion to actual, for kids to actually use the product. I've got two students in high school. I've got a junior and I've got a, so, a freshman 
One um, uh, is a little more academically advanced than the other. Neither of them have heard of paper. Neither. So I think that more so, I, I like the, the fact that if they're, if they're using social media to advertise, that's probably a good thing. But I will be very curious going from 38,291 learning activities to the goal of 100,000. That's almost three times as many. So I think that we'll need to, um, I think that you'll need to make sure that that happens and maybe we get a progress report six months down the road from now as to whether they're on track for that goal to either meet or exceed that goal. Um, I think that's a lofty goal, but I haven't seen the strategy around it either. So that's, you know, that's, I guess, to be to be seen whether or not they're effective. Um, but I do think that that's the, the bigger problem is the awareness piece that, that the students don't even know that that product exists. So um, good luck with that, and I hope that they are made more aware of that. I'm making my kid, kids aware of it now. Um, and and I'm hoping that more kids become aware of it if it's if it's there to you know truly help kids with online tutoring and that's for a parent who has children who have used you know outside sourcing for tutoring it's very helpful for me because tutoring is is expensive you know it's, it can be anywhere and you know Miss Combs you owned a tutoring company at one point in time it can be like twenty five to fifty dollars an hour depending on what type of tutoring is is done and what level of tutoring is done so as a parent this is great because I'm not having to pay additional dollars it's not exactly the same obviously as a one-to-one -one that you're gonna get with a tutor um, so it's not necessary for every student some students will still need that one-to-one -one with an actual tutor but maybe for the kids who need just a little bit of help and not necessarily that level of one-to-one -one, that this could be some Something that helps um, helps them as well. I'm just concerned about making sure that the the, the students know that exists and that what you know whether it's just bringing it to their attention on a regular basis, whether it's in the classroom or other outlets of marketing that that you know they just need to know where to go. Where to go is on Canvas. Where do you click? How do you get into it? And really, they're self-sufficient. They're going to figure it out. They don't really need anybody to teach them how to to do it. Maybe just to find it and click on it and get and get logged into it. But that's pretty much all that they're going to need, I think. Thanks. Thank you, Member Snively. I, I was going to say really the same thing. For me, it's just that we need to continue to market this program. When I really looked at who's using it, it happens to be the higher socioeconomic school. You know, I have a senior too, and I always have at least 10 kids staying at my house. And when I asked them the other day, you know, how many of you have heard of paper? It was about three or four students. So I'm like, how do we make sure that we get that out there? And that's always been my concern. But the idea that they are marketing it to half the price that we received last year. So the cost of it has decreased by 50% because they want a year to prove themselves that they can market out there, that we can go out there and that we can get the students, I think is very, very important. When you look at the money that's coming down from the state level and federal level, all of it has to do with after school t tutoring, supporting students because of the huge academic losses. So I know for myself, I've owned a tutoring center in some capacity for almost 17 years. The least I've ever charged was $35 for an hour. So the idea to have a full year for $12 for a child is just a really great opportunity. I don't think other companies can match that. I know that there's other interested parties that would like to have that, you know, but the idea of being able to do that at that level. Um, one of my friends the other day, she actually said, hey, what was that program you talked about? Because she's new to, to Florida. And she received a really great summary from her son, and she showed me the summary, and she found it really wonderful. So I think it's just the marketing out there, making sure that we can get the marketing. And if we can't, then then we won't use it. For, but for the upcoming year, when we know that there's academic loss, and I will say specifically, for those high school students that had went through COVID, and missed a lot of math and maybe they're taking you know algebra two but they didn't get a good foundation of algebra one they didn't get a good foundation of geometry because they were out with covid like my daughter she missed 40 days of school right the, those sources at two o'clock in the morning or one o'clock in the morning to be able to log on and ask a question about math is really important so we just have to get those sources out so i am going to support this thank you 
Uh, Member Perez? So I had the same concern as Member Vaughn with the teachers, you know, but you answered that question, and also as Member Snively. So I have three grandchildren that are in grade, um, between grade 6 and 12. And when I asked them, and they go to two separate schools, um, they had no idea what I was talking about. And they thought I was making things up to see if, um, you know, they were studying. Um, and, yeah, and they thought because I'm a board member, I was making things up to see if I could catch them in something. And I said, no, um, this actually exists. So um, how is it that we're going to be pushing this out to those schools to ensure that these students do are able to capture this? And then I have one more question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really do believe the linchpin in this is the teacher because students will respond to what teachers expect. And if teachers feel that this program is valuable, we have to do a better job of really educating our teachers about the power of the program and how they can leverage it for essay review, to help them in, in their workload, but also the, the importance for their students to have this access beyond school hours, right? So I think the teachers will become the best marketers for this program than anyone else because students listen to their teachers. And I think that's our opportunity in, in, as we move forward, is that our, if our teachers can be our salespeople for us, we will get an explosion of usage. Will paper put up um, like posters or anything around the schools? Absolutely, they, and they have. We, we actually did accomplish that goal, so we have posters out. Uh, like I said, a, a, a list of several different marketing. I mean, we've done TV commercials. Our social media team has probably overkilled uh, overkilled on paper it's all over our front page of our website you know it's ev it's everywhere but that's why we i still believe that when the teachers become the salespeople, you'll see better return because we can post this stuff everywhere but if they don't really understand what paper and, and that can be tricky right you see paper well what does that have to do with actually tutoring right so having those explanations and really understanding it uh, i do think that's going to be the linchpin now, Superintendent, we have a lot of students coming in from, you know, um, different areas, Cuba to name, name one. Um, how will this program assist our ELL learners? Yes, ma'am. This is an opportunity for m multiple um, languages to be engaged with through our students. So one thing papers continue to strength is they understand the diversity of our community. And so they have the resources available to be able to connect with our learners and our families. Okay. Because I heard um, Mr. Connor say that, you know, the um, information was going to go out in different languages to the parents, but he never addressed the ELL learners themselves. But thank you. Thank you, Member Press. Member Hahn? Thank you, Member Combs. Um, I, I shared, you know, I shared some of the same concerns that have been talked about tonight. And I was a little surprised at the utilization rate because, um, you know, I, again, I really thought this would be just used so widely across our district. Um, and uh, so I'm glad that you're recognizing that this is a communications issue for a, a big part of this and that paper is going to be engaging around a communications campaign and um you know because like i've said just if, if nobody knows about it you know it's like if, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it did it really fall you know so i mean if nobody knows about it is it really valuable for us so if we can't you know i think this is a good year to kind of um re uh ignite you know this campaign and and try and get some interest um, you know, I do value Member Combs's comments around um, the value because that, this is her expertise. This is where she ran her business. She understands the cost of these types of services. So I found that um, information really valuable. So thank you, Member Combs. And, um, you know, I think having this 24-7 access, we have students who work after school. They don't get home late. They may, you know having a tutor it may not be realistic given the commitments they have the cost is outrageous i mean i know for my own child we do small group tutoring when needed because the cost can run as high as a hundred dollars an hour 
and um, and the multi-language piece that uh, Member Perez brought up is really important. Um, having so many different languages that um, our students need uh, would benefit from instruction in their own native language, and the fact that this has that embedded in it to a larger extent than we provide um, is positive. So I'll be supporting this item. Thank you, Member Hahn. Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair, and and also I. I uh, I think it's so important, Mr. Conley, to have that progress report so we'll know how well we're doing for the upcoming year. And I would also like to, what I like about it, you'll be working with transformation uh, so we could get some of that digital divide caught up with, which I think is very important. You want to say something about that? Just because I know you were a former coach, we also talked to Mr. Robinson in athletics, and we are going to make it a part of their mandatory study hall as well. And I didn't say that earlier, so I want to make sure you just prompted me to. Well, you already got my vote. Yes, <laughs> I did. That sealed the deal with Shake Washington. Get that fourth. But uh, anyway, I think it's a great deal, and, and uh, I, I will support it. Yes. Superintendent Davis, you wanted to have some closing comments on Yes, ma'am, and, and I appreciate the conversation because this is a lot of money. And, and, and I also thank our team for going back to paper and holding them accountable about the usage rate and taking it from $2.6 million to a $1.2 million ask and expenditure. And also us being able to leverage some additional fund that will come available to use it categorical over the next year or two. But I think this year is pivotal for us to determine the overall effectiveness. And we will provide the quarterly mid-year report and, you know, to be able to show the board the analytics and and also to look at the impact of the marketing that continues that we will partner with paper to be able to push out. If this deems at the end of the year not to have major increase in value with usage rate, with also students and number of schools, then openly we will we'll bring this back to the board. And I think that that's about having uh, organizational controls and quality controls to make certain that we are getting the return on investment in this process. But we appreciate it. Go ahead. Member Hahn. Uh, one, one request, um, kind of piggybacking on what Member Snively said, is um, if you could bring us some utilization numbers, maybe quarterly yep. um, throughout the year, I would greatly appreciate it. Maybe you could put that on the, um, what is that, the Suspended. list? Thank you, Suspended yes, Agenda. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, at any rate, what I wanted to say is the sustainability, uh, Mr. Connor. Um, Any time that we have a, uh, a, a infusion of money, a device, in my mind, that original output of cost uh, and learning curve, if we just cut it short, it will be just like any other program that comes and goes. And that is really bad for morale. Teachers want continuity. Students need continuity. The board members need the same, but as uh, Member Hahn and the rest of us said, we de definitely have to have the data, and suspended agenda is, is, a, is a great vehicle to do so. So. Thank you, Member Gray. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes six to one with Member Vaughn voting no. We'll move on to 301, approve all improvement plans, SIP, School Advisory Council, SAC, composition forms, and school improvement waivers for 2022-2023. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. Hillsborough County School Board Policy 2120 states that school board shall annually approve school improvement plans in an effort to be able to acknowledge the, you know, the efforts, the work, and concentration of each individual school in order to move the needle in performance and also the well-being overall of our students. In this, you'll see that there's major focal points in our school, school improvement plans that are reviewed and thoroughly supported through our schools and our divisions to be able to look at uh, content areas of focus, how they will lift certain contents in order to in, in move the needle and help students with performance, also with family engagement, what they seek to do from a professional development perspective, what will be their instructional strategies at their particular school, how they will address any behavior strategies, and also being able to use all this information based on data analytics to be able to make informed decisions, to be able to help and engage our stakeholders with input and to be able to create this fluent document that we see in front of you this evening. So just bringing this to the board for approval, but also understanding that this document will could be uh, adjusted as they continue to look at progress monitoring and, and also work with their local instructional leadership teams and community to determine and, and recognize priorities within their particular school. 
Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C301. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Gray. Member Snively, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Uh, no, I just thought it was um, important to pull this one and just vote separately because it's, um, you know, bar to support our board policy and to also um, highlight the item and, and, and the fact that um, we are striving to have more A, B, and C schools and, and less D and F. So I just thought it would be good in case other board members also had any comments or discussion on it as well. Thank you, Member Snively. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 701, approve invitation to bid 2225 DSTCH International Parts and Labor. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is an opportunity for us to acknowledge a corporation to be able to provide a, vend a vendor for OEM parts and repairs for our school buses. As we know, we have so many fleet that are on the road and to be able to identify a partner to be able to assist to make certain that we have continuous movement throughout this district for accessibility to, to transport students. At the same token, be able to make sure that we have staff to be able to serve schools to address any uh, continued issues. So we see there is a significant increase in, uh, in cost and we have pulled this due to the fact that it is uh, general funds and the cost is related to increase of uh, parts, the fuel that it it takes for the for that co corporation to come to our uh, vehicles to be able to address them and also an increase in labor thank you superintendent davis i need a motion and a second to approve item c701 i have a motion by member washington i have a second by member gray any discussion please vote when your lights appear And it passes unanimously. 703, invitation to bid 22137 MSTEJ Wax and Flooring Products. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is an opportunity to award a vendor to be able to address uh, the, the re- finishing of our floor hardwood floors in, in our school district. This is the finished floors. They look at uh, floor re uh, removal. They look at cleaning the floors and also being able to go back and make certain that we are restoring these floors. These are for every hardware surfaces within our schools. Um, you will see that this is for uh, raw products and materials and also labor as well. This is a $903,000 expenditure that we use for general funds. Um, you will see an increase and this increases once again because of the CPI, the consumer price Price index continues to grow and we have to be able to do this to make certain that we are in compliance with all the district safety approved products and also being able to approve the policies and make certain the students have and teachers have the best facilities possible every day thank you superintendent davis i need a motion a second to approve item c703 i have a motion by member washington i have a second by member gray any discussion please vote when your lights appear And it passes unanimously. 704, request for proposals, 22235 MSTEJ Solid Waste and Recycling Services. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is an opportunity for the school district to really look at um, the solid waste and recycling services and make certain we're in compliance with Hillsborough County expectations and also the, the city of T uh, Tampa expectations and requirements. And what this does is really look at our solid waste and recycling management services as we transition to be able to, um, to ha have this expenditures and recycle due to the fact we're a big organization. This is a $2.7 million expenditure with, within our school district, which is out of general fund. Thank you. I need a motion and a second to approve item C704. I have a motion by Member Gray. I have a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. <clears throat> And it passes unanimously. 706, approved change order number one of the access control system installations at various sites, project number 100474. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is continued efforts for safety and security. One thing we want to continue to do is make certain that every one of our structures from elementary, middle school, and high school have hardened structures to be able to, to protect who's transitioning and gaining access to our facilities um, every single day within the organization. So this is continued to expansion of the work we've already done for the last couple of years and to make sure 
certain that every one of our facilities is primed and ready and, and has controls to be able to protect our employees in the same token, in the same token our students. This is a $1.2 million budgeted uh, access that we will use with safety and security dollars that are categorical funds outlined and identified by the state. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-706. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Gray. Um, I pulled this item, and I know you answered some of the questions that I had. I, I'm, I'm really glad to make sure. I, I know we're putting safety as a big priority in our district. It is the, the number one, you know, when parents send their children to school. And I'm glad that we're doing several additional safeguards, um, and I appreciate that. Um, please vote when your lights appear, unless anybody else has any comments. Passes unanimously. 711, agreement with the City of Tampa, Tampa Police Department for the 2022 2023 School Resource Officer Program. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is to make certain that we can remain in compliance with with um, with the bills that were passed due to the horrific incident within Parkland. To make certain that we put an asset at every one of our schools. This is a renewal of a contract uh, with an annual renewal with Tampa Bay uh, with Tampa Police Department to make certain we have resource officers in 26 of our schools. This covers 50 percent of the FTE of our officers, the salaries, the benefits, their vehicles, and their equipment. And for us, it's a uh, contract that does not exceed two million dollars. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-711. I have a motion by Member Gray. I have a second by Member Washington. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I actually had some constituent calls on this, which is the reason that I pulled this item. Um, so you said there were 26 schools that were identified? Yes, ma'am. Anything then, that's in the city of Tampa, they provide supports. So it's the city of Tampa yes, that helps identify what those schools are. Um, and the description of it um, says that part of the, the focus is um, addressing gun violence on school campus. So just help me understand for my constituents, is this because the officers are better trained to respond to that, or how does this match up with the description, this partnership, how does that match up with the description in the agenda item? Yes, ma'am, this is all about being able to, A, to make sure we're in compliance with statutory requirements, but B, it's about being able to provide, you know, individuals that are sophisticatedly trained with you know by the Tampa Police Department that know the community and serve the particular schools within the, with with under their scope and under their under their jurisdictions so they have a number of elements they have to be trained upon they're identified uh, statutory required but also identified within their police division and then that transitions to be able to to really build mentorships and also gain access to educate our students to make the right decisions every single day so related to this particular item this is just being able to properly cover and so that we can have individuals that are transition. We have the option to either place those uh, individuals that are trained through the Guardian, uh, historically Guardian program, Guardian program, which is the school officers that we have in some of our schools in elementary, but we, we proceeded to transition to put schools that are in the Tampa regions that have full-bledged resource officers within those schools every single day. Got you. And so would you say, because the way that you you know, you talked about it. Part of the focus is fostering positive relationships with be. our students and making sure that they're supporting them and making good choices. Yes, ma'am. That is a uh, continuous uh, criteria that we want to make certain that we don't need individuals that are just on campus to enforce the law. Even though that is a role and responsibility, we need them to be able to build relationships every single day, in, not only with our students, but within that particular community and be a part of that in a proactive uh, manner. So educating, mentoring, just building, you know, positive connections that's what we want out of those individuals and at the same token being able to enforce the law and protect our students you know and also our employees on campus and so in lieu of this in county schools where they're not within the city limits you're saying we utilize our guardian and litem program we use we, we use our school officers and we use guardian our and litem's different 
Guardy. Yes, ma'am. We use our school officers at elementary schools, and also we leverage in our high schools and middle schools outside of the, of the city of Tampa, we use the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. And they do a really good job. And, you know, Chief O'Connor, the same token with, uh, you know, Sheriff Chad Cronister, they work in concert with John Newman in an effort to be able to stand up a workforce that is consistent in their approach every day. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Press? Over the weekend, I, w I was, um, I had the amazing opportunity to attend the Tampa Bay Criminal Justice Summit, and I sat on a panel regarding, um, you know, our Hillsborough County and issues with our black and Latino population and the impact of um, our children and the school to prison pipeline. And um, a lot of the conversation was surrounding the fact of the um, SROs in our schools. Um, can you can you um, speak to that, please? Speak to the, the, the relationship or the, the school to prison pipeline issue and the SROs. And yes, ma'am. So through the chair, it's extremely important for us to be able to continue to to really focus on that, you know, breaking the cycle of prison to pipeline. And, and this is all about making certain that we have a code of student conduct. And at the same token, we build beautiful relationships between students and our teachers and our administration and our resource officers on campus every single day. And we are making certain that we implement, you know, positive behavior intervention supports along the way that will really coach our students to make good decisions. And this is where seven mindsets come into play, especially for the second level really so students can make a just become a better self and I think from from our side of it what we've seen as we transition through the pandemic and as we transition out of the pandemic we do see that there was a spike in related to student behaviors but we've tried to be able to concentrate and reduce the number of arrests you know over the last two years um, you know, and that's through just really putting interventions in place before those arrests are made. And one of those examples is, you know, through the, the process of uh, reviewing and putting mitigation strategies for de-escalation strategies for, that we train, to be able to, to train for trauma-informed schools, to be able to look at youth mental health, and, and to give our teachers and, and leaders coping strategies to be able to, to provide ongoing supports for our learners. And, you know, we will continue to, to focus on, uh, you know, decreasing the arrest for our black and brown students and every student within, within this community because we don't believe one bad decision defines who that learner is. You know, we want to be able to make certain that there's proactive strategies that we can entail that we can help be able to build the, the intellectual behavior capacity of that learner in the same token of the family as well. So it's a focal point for us. Um, but openly, we had like, we did see an increase last year of uh, discipline referrals because we were coming out of the pandemic and some of our students hadn't been in our campuses in 18 months. So we had to redefine our culture, redefine systems and processes, and we're doing that every single day now as well. So this partnership is also to assist that that um, building that partnership building Absolutely. with our students and the SROs as well. Yes, ma'am. It is vital for us to all be on the same page and, and just re really having the understanding of what we're trying to accomplish and help them, you know, just go to school disruption free and the resource officers be there more than just an enforcer, but be there to be able to help in any way. Because it is important to build that positive um, influence with our black and Latino students and um, to decrease the school to prison population right now um, with our black and Latino students. Thank you. Thank you, Member Perez. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 1001 Edge Point mm -hmm. Synergy Training Supplement. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. As you know, in July, in July of 2019, the school board approved the transition to EduPoint education systems to be able to move forward as the new system information system, the new student information system. And that information system will look at uh, capturing master schedules, look at the enrollment, look at grading, student records, look at um, uh, attendance, behavior interaction, ESE, ESE content, all to be the really the major hub as we transition. This year we let we 
launched our grade book, so we are going to full implementation next year. So bring to the board to recognize that we have to have a, 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 an immediate and aggressive push for professional development, and this is for non-instructional personnel. This is for data processors. This is for bookkeepers. This is for executive assistants, and, and also a transition to teachers and administrators as well, because we have to be able to transition efficiency efficiently. Um, this is you know this transition was supposed to happen earlier, uh, before, but we were faced with the pandemic, and we wanted to make certain that we are because we're paying for this product that we transition and we're efficient in the professional development so that we have a seamless opening to July 2023 as we move to a new student information system. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-1001. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Gray. Member Gray, you pull this item. Do you have any questions or comments? No, my only comment is I just wanted the SIS uh, to be um, shared as soon as possible, the new learning system. So teachers are uh, will be uh, let's just say keenly awaiting. Uh, should be a lot easier. Yes, ma'am. Should be a big transformation for computer usage. So um, I'm glad to see it occurring. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Vaughn? Yes. Can So we're outsourcing the training on this for $330,000. For three hundred and thirty thousand dollars, what does that look like? Is that going to be in-person training, or is this yet again people watching videos and webinars for this much money? What dozen weeks? Development of the training materials, and they would actually allow um, us uh, afford us the ability to train our trainers. Uh, we would have personnel identified at each of the school sites that ultimately would be the localized champion or trainer, um, the go-to person, as it were, uh, when it comes to the training. Uh, the materials themselves will be um, customized based off of our installation, um, so it's not something that's just off the shelf. Uh, it will consist of written materials. It will, will likely consist of videos um, and other, tr other training materials, uh, so it's going to be uh, multimodal. So we're paying this much money for them to train some people who are going to be at our schools to help people use the materials and watch webinars and learn things online? So most of this is actually for them to develop the training materials itself. Uh, within our RPD department uh, and within the IT organization, we do not have uh, enough resources that we can allocate to this specific purpose. Um, so this would involve a total of 251 man days worth of development for the training materials, and then also implementing that materials for uh, a train the trainer type scenario. Ms. Ms. Vaughn, can I transition to Mr. McCauley as well? Ms. McCauley. And to the chair, as a continuation of that, the, ma the materials that they're going to provide for us are going to be built around the customization elements of Synergy and the SIS. We've met with um, uh, Debbie Pepage, Melia Jackson, um, Mr. Connor, uh, at Tom Weeks, we are identifying who those data processors are that are in our in our buildings, the bookkeepers, the secretaries that are, are really going to be the ones that we're targeting with this kind of material. They will help us basically crosswalk the work that they do every day with the materials so that ultimately when Synergy is launched, it will be much more familiar to their day-to-day -day operations than something that Synergy could just develop for us in a generic fashion. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes six to one with Member Vaughn voting no. 1002, the SHI quote number 22620117 with SHI Incorporated for Infor's Software Licensing Renewal and Support. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is an opportunity for us to provide upgrade to Infor, our enterprise resource uh, planning software, in addition with our workforce management suites. This is agreement to be able to make certain that our Infor cloud suite that focuses on our financials, our management supplies, our human capital uh, needs, and at the same time being able to look at attendance services as well. This is definitely an expenditure that, that we have uh, historically had. We This is a $2.1 million expenditure that we have to use out of general fund dollars. Mr. Week, Donald Week, anything? Uh, nothing. 
Thank you so much, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-1002. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Gray. Thank you. Member Gray, you pull this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, quick question. Um, Dr. Weeks, uh, Superintendent Davis, uh, am I correct in uh, in asking uh, I mean, or in saying that this controls this system controls about every aspect of HR? So, so uh, this actually is the lifeblood of, of the district uh, in terms of our overall data, uh, from our financial data, from our human resources, our human capital data. Um, and this is really provides us all the reporting um, and the data that's required to make uh, comprehensive and, and uh, decisive uh, decision-making processes uh, for the district. So this is how we actually pay our bills. This is how we hire our people. You know, this is how we perform our business functions for the district. So essentially, we must have this because payroll is attached to this, right? Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. We will now go to our only informational item, Hillsborough County Public Schools Charter Schools Annual Report. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is an opportunity for us to bring to the board, you know, all information related to every charter school within our organization. This looks at an informational sheet, and it's an annual report that looks at um, school information, looks at their enrollment, their academic performance. It looks at the operational compliance and also their financial performance as well. So this is a snapshot of how every charter school under our umbrella is functioning within our organization. And this document really gets to the point where us to make informed decisions of how we support, how we have conversations about how we continue to make certain that we are uh, moving in the right direction, and also make certain there's accountability discussions related to uh, ongoing standards and quality and quality standards related to implementation of their charter. Uh, Chintia, you want to be able to expand it? Good evening. Uh, yes, it's a best practice uh, based on the Florida principles, uh, principles and standards for authorizers in the state of Florida. It's not a requirement, uh, but it's definitely a best practice. So every year we put together, the charter office puts together the numbers based on uh, um, enrollment, uh, academics, and uh, financials, and that way, and then we post it on the website uh, for the public to, um, to view. Thank you, um, Dr. DeLang. This is an informational item, so we're not going to vote on that, but we'll go ahead and, and go to comments. Member Vaughn, begin with you. Thank you. Um, I just, I really love the layout of this. I thought it was really easy to read and I really appreciate it. And I think it's very eye opening and really important. And because we make it public, I just really encourage parents, especially when they're looking at charter schools, to go and look at, um, you know, the grades and the information on here and specifically the statistics as well. I mean, one thing that I thought was really interesting when I was looking through this is, you know, how many of these have a very low free and reduced lunch as well as a low, you know, um, ESE population, um, which I think is really interesting because um, they're not necessarily dealing with the same challenges that we are. But overall, I just wanted to say, I, you know, I really appreciate this document. I thought it was really user friendly, very easy to read, really l laid out very well. I appreciate all the hard work that went into it. And I just encourage parents, you know, when they're making choices to go and read this information and really know, you know, make educated choices. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vaughn. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Gray? <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. DeLang. This is very informative, uh, and uh, ditto, ditto, um, Member Vaughn. I would say this, though, even though we've added, you've added upon our request more columns of information, um, very good for the parents to know, because this is the era of competition, school choice. Um, Dr. DeLang, I, I went over the list of certified and non-certified teachers. And I think it probably is, in, uh, it's more, much more critical now because of the teacher shortage nationwide. But I think if we have a, another column that shows certified versus uncertified, now I know about the two-year promissory 
uh, but the different categories of certification against, uh, you know, Dr. Marie Whalen, you mentioned that all of our Hillsborough County Public School teachers are certified. So I think that's important for the public to, and you can uh, interrupt uh, for sure, but that's the quote that I got. I think it's very important the public sees the absolute maturity of the faculty and the maturity meaning the amount of years that they have experienced and for sure if they're certified, if they are certified in their subject area. Your comment? Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, it, it's very difficult to capture um, um, one given time uh, of all um, charter teachers uh, that are certified. Again, we do uh, track, actually our certification office tracks that. Uh, they go through our certification office in HR uh, to determine whether they're eligible or not. Um, some who are eligible uh, uh, start working as non-certified and then they work towards their certification and uh, between our office and uh, um, this, our certification office we uh, continuously ask where they are in, uh, in uh, earning their uh, certification uh, through either our ACP program through the district or our, the HCC's EPI program. So that's ongoing uh, all throughout the year. And actually, I think uh, the HCP program is a two or three year program. So it, it takes a while. Um, so it, maybe what we could capture is the actual certified teachers, but not uh, those teachers who are eligible to be certified or working towards their certificate. Yeah, and I think that's a, a great start on Olive Branch, but I will say when you have, say, Na Navigator uh, Leadership School that is minus um, probably about, hmm, hold on, I have the numbers in my head, but it might be almost 26 teachers that are uncertified, according to the list that you gave me of certified versus uncertified. That's significant for any school. It's significant if we had in, say, uh, any given of our schools, if we had 26 uncertified teachers. What I'm saying is if there's a way we can be more uh, specific with the experience level, and you and I can talk offline or off dais, uh, but I did want to bring that up. And I, I specifically want to thank you, too, for putting all this together again. I know a lot of work went behind this. Absolutely, I, and uh, I, I just want to make sure the staff in the charter office gets the credit because it does take a lot of time and a lot of, um, uh, it takes months actually uh, to do this and uh, they are just a phenomenal group of uh, ladies. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. DeLing. Um Member Perez? Yeah, I just wanted to say this, that the parents really need to look at this, um, especially when you have some schools that are decreasing in enrollment. Um, and, you know, the, the grades are very telling um, in there. Um, but, you know, thank you. Thank you for putting this together. But And also um, the, the fact that there's a lot, we have a lot of students that are, um, economically disadvantaged using charter schools um, and the um, ethnicity, the demographics of these students um, in these schools. Um, you know, the parents might just want to look at this. And, um, but the comparison between the district and the charter school, um, thank you for, for, for putting that together as well. This, is, this just was very eye-opening for me. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. DeLang, for being here and for you and your team for your constant work for in the charter office. It's amazing. There's just a small group of you, and you're doing the job of probably 100 people. So thank you very much. Um, so this is an informational item. We're not, we will now move to our closing and superintendent comments. Thank you, Dr. DeLang. Superintendent Davis, I'll start with you. It's your comments. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so very much. This evening, we want to be able to look at uh, district updates, look at NAEP results, highlight contingent items, and provide update on boundary and suspended agenda items. 
Um, right now, the biggest thing is we want to recognize our principal of the year, which is Katie Rocha at Newsom Senior High School. Well deserved. She is a magnificent leader in a couple years in her practice, but she has done a really good job in a very large school. So congratulations to Katie for her hard work, continued efforts, and you know such excitement to be able to re to visit her school and, and acknowledge her for her hard work every single day. And then also our assistant principal of the year is Angela Brown at Liberty Middle School. She was there since she has been there since the opening of the school, and which is really cool. Um, she has great wisdom, great structure. She is a very good leader that's well respected at that school and i um, excited to see the future here for her in Hillsborough County as we transition um, over our needs. <clears throat> and then also we want to recognize that November is Family Engagement Month. Our Family and Engagement uh, Department is so excited to be able to continue to engage with our, with our families. They do a wonderful job to be able to understand that parents are our first educators, and so they have proactive solutions. They have the power hour, and that happens in both English and Spanish, and that happens on a, a, you know, a continuous basis. It's free to our families, and they really focus on how parents can be advocates for their children, how they can focus on student achievement, and also being able to help them in partnership with financial literacy. And we're thankful to our partner of Suncoast Credit Union to be in front of our families as well. So we want to recognize that this is a holistic approach in education. We cannot do this in isolation. We need our families to be in the forefront, to be continued champions, to be able to create positive change within Hillsborough County. And then also we, uh, we had a kickoff for CEOs in schools on October the 12th with all of our elementary principals and our business leaders got a chance to come together. We're so thankful for Heath to being able to champion this initiative and also Brian Butler who, are, who was the originator of this and continue to champion. This happens on November the 4th. So any, you know, this is looking for an opportunity for business, leader, business leaders, uh, civic leaders, community leaders to come in our schools and be a, a part to be able to determine how efficient that we have been and really not to, to only look at building a financial partnership, but really build in systemic partnership through agencies that can really help us, uh, you know, fill the gaps within our community. And we really think we appreciate all the CEOs to be a part of this process as we move to November the 4th. And then also NAEP. And, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, last week to be able to recognize the, you know, the look at the Nationals Report Card. We see every article that talks about there's been that, that COVID has had a major negative impact on the movement of acceleration with students' uh, performance. But one thing we have to recognize is the hard work that Hillsborough County teachers, administrators, re regional superintendents, district staff, chiefs have put in place to be able to create to change. And this is a, a slide that recognizes all of the jurisdictions that were part of the uh, TUDA assessment, which is the Trial Urban District Assessment. And you see it's all over the country. And then once again, recognizing that our fourth grade students, this is the first time in history that fourth grade reading and mathematics in Hillsborough County is ranked number one in the nation. And it is about the hard work and concentration of our teachers, but it's also coupled with all the positive changes that we have implemented in the school district over the last couple of years to be able to focus on instructional frameworks, align curriculum, and give sophisticated platforms that allow us to be successful. So hats off to everyone actively involved in this organization. This goes to every employee, every student, every board member, every family member who's taken this serious. And um, same thing in fourth, in fourth grade mathematics. And then we know that uh, we've got areas to be able to grow in the area of, of eighth grade mathematics because those are all complex contents that pre-algebra is actively engaged. And we're looking to figure out the causation for that. And then we also want to recognize November the 17th. This is the Great American Teach-In. This is an opportunity for our volunteers, sport figures, local personalities, retirees, you know, our parents, community volunteers to really come in and just have conversations with our with our new generation. And this is about an hour in our classrooms, just inspire students to be focused and talk about what they can look for in the future and talk about our journeys and help them to be able to get there. You know, last year we had over 6,000 speakers that impacted over 98,000 students. Where anyone that's actively wants to be actively participate in this process, we ask them to either call 813-272-4446 or go to volunteer.services at hcps.net 
and be actively engaged to volunteer to go into our schools. And I'll be there and look forward to our partnerships for, for our community. And we're so thankful for individuals giving their time to our students to allow them to progress. And then for our consent agenda this evening, you know, we have Steinbrenner. They're taking the journey going to Northeast Florida and also to Florida State, going to Jacksonville University in Florida State to take field trips just to give hope and inspirations for our students to be able, those who want to transition to post-secondary opportunities. And then goal five about operational responsibility. Uh, one thing we committed to the board is to bring in our budget analysis to the board. And we, as we transition to finalize in, in the communication phase of phase two, this is all about bringing clarity of the projects, the intent, the inclusiveness of our demographics, and also informing our, our community about whatever changes we aspire to make. And this is the schedule for implementation in our phase two. With uh, We have countywide virtual webinars that take place. We'll have three virtual engagement opportunities with multiple civic organizations identified for feedback, for boundary analysis. And then the last one with 10 in-person engagement directly impacted with community stakeholders to be able to go through scenarios. So there's interactive interaction and conversations to make informed decision as an organization. We know that this is no one through our survey wants to be able to address or have their boundaries adjusted, but this hasn't been done in decades and it has to be done in an organization to be more efficient along the way and uh, look forward to bringing that information to the board. And finally, literacy update for our pre-kindergarten. I'm going to transition to, uh, to Mr. Connor to allow him to talk about um, our dedicated supports for pre-K classrooms, expanded instructional guides, family engagement, and also our early learning teams. Thanks, Mr. Superintendent. I just did it. I just did it. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, we can go to the next one. <laughs> No, th we just were proud. I mean, you know, it's a it's a K-12 approach. It even starts in pre-K, and, and we've done some amazing work um, along the way in our pre-kindergarten, and we've now have dedicated district support in every one of our pre-K classrooms, really focusing on supporting the teachers with implementation with instruction and the curriculum. Uh, in terms of curriculum and the, the instructional guides, we've really expanded what's built into that to help support our teachers, really looking at how they can use formative tools to, based on evidence and research practices to make sure that students are uh, getting a really holistic education. Um, also, the team has really done a great job in engaging families through the monthly newsletters that we're creating, bringing home those focus skills and those follow-up activities that can easily be implemented in home at home, and those are in English and in Spanish. And also just uh, that vertical articulation because we know once they transition into kindergarten up to first grade, uh, that vertical articulation and getting that alignment from those early developmental standards to the new best standards is critical. So we have aligned our district support to help with that vertical articulation so that we can see that. So that's the update for pre-kindergarten literacy. Thank you, sir. And thank you. That's it. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Okay, Member Washington, I think usually we'll just leave it as comments. And I, I think people have some direct questions, so during their comment, they can. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, we usually do that. Member, Member Washington, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments about tonight with the NWACP. Uh, we have to realize the operation of the WAACP <clears throat> is not our responsibility. This is the board. We don't we don't govern the operation of of the NWACP, and uh, we did have some concerns tonight. And I would like for the superintendent to elaborate on those concerns, please, if you would. Yes, sir, the chair. Oh, we have, we recognize the concerns uh, when this uh, initiative took place. I believe it was about a week ago, week and a half ago. Um, we know that we do have an MOU that stands and try to show good faith partnership with the NWACP, who continues to be active participants in, in our community. Uh, I am, we will be looking into any violations of our MOU to be able to address that uh, with the uh, leadership of the NAACP openly to be able to protect the school district. And that's what, you know, our, our overarching needs have to be in the forefront. So this is about making certain that there's no other entities that are using those facilities and that if we're going to be able to host them as a partner, then they continue to make certain that uh, they are in seamless communication with their stakeholders and community holders to make certain they're all on the same page with the implementation. But we would definitely look and, uh, at the MOU that we currently have 
and have multi and have conversations with uh, with leadership and President Lewis to be able to address any concerns of the community as we move forward. Thank you, <clears throat> appreciate it. Um, I want to go into our uh, this weekend at Allen Temple. Uh, Member Perez and I had a great time. We had the uh, health fair at Blake. Ooh, quite a few people were there. We gave vaccinations. We had they had music, food. A lot of health uh, enhancement there, which was good for the community. It was a community affair, and we had a great time, and we also helped out the community with health issues. Um, moving along, we also uh, also was able to attend the uh, House of Marriage luncheon. Uh, it was great. I had opportunity to speak to people I hadn't seen in a long time, as we call it, the old timers. They were there, and I had a chance to share the good things that we are doing in Hillsborough County. And they were really, really great. Appreciated all the information that I shared to them. We were looking for your suit, but I know I feel in for you well. I told a couple of jokes too, so they were okay. Yeah, we we, we really had a good time. Yes, yes, I understand. And and again, I just want to say to uh, Miss Snively, we love you. You're going to miss you. You've been a part, uh, especially my two years here. Uh, you've been a. a, a a very important part of the board with that experience, so we're really going to miss you. And uh, I know whatever you do in life, you're going to be successful. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I have. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Perez? So, um, um, Superintendent, um, I do have a concern as um, – as a board member, Woodson Elementary. I think you and I had a conversation that, you know, when um, anyone from the state comes to either um, um, give a, a child a, a test or um, ha um, take a child out of the district or a school, that there is a process. There's a process and, um, you know, what happens when a school does not follow that process? Yes, ma'am. So first and foremost to the chair, we it is an expectation that every school follows procedures related to being able to check out students. We know that we have family members. We know we have caregivers that check out students every single day. We also have case managers that check out students along the way. And is there our role, there, our role and responsibility is to check identification, to check those individuals in. They have a sign-out log. Do they, they sign out so that we truly understand and approve of those individuals that are transitioning and, and taking our students you know, bringing them in the school and also transition out of school. So if it is not followed, then we will start progressive discipline immediately. And this is outlined by our collective bargain agreement. And, and this is an expectation for this. As it relates to the school, you know, a, a, deci a poor decision was made. We have addressed that individual employee and we'll continue to monitor the situation. And at principal meetings, I will make certain that I remind all of our leaders to make certain that there, there's protocols to be followed because safety is our greatest priority within our school. When children are um, come through the doors of our schools, we are then responsible for those children. Absolutely. I know that when my grandchildren are with me, I feel, you know, I am like, you know, eagle eyes because I know that their mother, my daughter, has, uh, you know, um, placed those children in my, although they're my grandchildren, in my responsibility. So I understand that when, you know, they're missing for one second, you know, my heart drops to my feet and I'm just running and trying to find them. And so I can't imagine when a, pa when a parent comes to school and they're told, oh, somebody took your child and it's a 35 minute window before they know where their child is. Um, that's unexcusable. The chair, I completely agree. In, in this particular case, th this was the case manager checks the student out multiple times a week, and the sign-out log just was not signed. It is unacceptable. This should be followed every single day, regardless if you know. If I'm the parent and I go and check out Caitlin every single day, I should be required to show my identification and to sign that log every single day, regardless if they know me as superintendent or whatever it may be. It is an expectation for everyone. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And um, I also want to talk about these textbooks. So 
I I have an issue with with teachers not having textbooks. Can you address that, please? Yes, Mr. the Chair. This is what we continue to face related to STEM, STEM scopes. It's our math adoption. We uh, selected a, uh, a vendor in March. We have informed that vendor of what we needed. They have all that in writing in April, and it became to a paper shortage. And this is not only unique to Hillsborough County, but throughout the state and throughout the nation, that many school districts do not have materials. Um, everyone ha and they, ha they don't have the print materials. Everyone has the digital materials. And the biggest stressor is being able to make certain they are printing the content to be able to to interact with our students. As of right now, we're looking at third grade student notebooks that do not, that do in elementary schools that students do not have those notebooks, and some of our fourth grade students as well do not have that content, uh, do not have the notebooks. Our teachers are doing a remarkable job, and also our leaders as well, printing out content and academic services and providing uh, continued uh, support through whether it be Daniela Simic, whether it be uh, Debbie, Debbie Pepe. They have been inundated schools to be able to identify. One thing that uh, I have asked and engaged our team to do is to reach out our schools and determine whether or not they need ongoing assistance with paper purchasing or toner as well, because that never should be a barrier to be able to make certain that we have systemic movement. Um, I am deeply concerned about this. We will address this upon completion once we have all of our materials in hand at every one of our schools. We will make certain that I get with Mr. Connor, his team, and also with our legal department to determine whether or not there's liquidated damages that we can assess for not having the content within our schools and hold them accountable for that process. Thank you. And the elevator. Um, you know, um, a child with disabilities always has to have accessibility. And if there was a fire, if there was, you know, an issue, you know, that child should always have accessibility to a way out the elevator. Is that already handled and fixed? Through the chair, I just learned of that issue tonight. So uh, it sounds like uh, through the teacher that spoke this evening that the operations team did address it. I will say openly that we are, we've had major concerns being able to get parts for everything that we have to be able to make certain our facilities are functional. We've had difficulty with AC parts. I'm sure the same thing happened. I can't speak to this particular issue. I'm going to get with our team uh, this evening to be able to speak to it, but it sounds like it's got an operational. One day is, is, is too much, and we've got to have additional accommodations for that, for that student. So it, it, we know that if we have an elevator that is, that's not functional, and that a child needs to be able to uh, transition, we need to make the accommodations for that student and lead that student, if we can, on the first floor and being able to serve that child uh, every single day. So, you know, put in different situations, you know, we'll find out more about it. But openly, we'll, you know, if we don't know about it or you know, I don't know about it, I can't be able to triage to be able to assist. So I will um, have better understanding of where we are with that process and provide that in the feedback and follow up to the board. Thank you. And I just want to also thank Equality Florida for recognizing me as a champion for, um, for you know, um, equality, basically. And, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Member Press. Member Vaughn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to try to do it quickly. Um, first of all, I want to say happy belated to Diwali, to the Asian families in my community. I have a huge population there, and we were able to participate in fireworks and sparklers and so many amazing festivities. It's really beautiful. Um, so I want to say happy belated Diwali. Um, I also wanted to say a shout out to Ms. Brown. I know you covered this in your um, superintendent comments, but for winning um, Vice Principal of the Year Award, she's an amazing Vice Principal. We're extremely lucky to have her. I'm so proud of Liberty and the work that they're doing there. So I also wanted to address that. Um, you know, I know that we had a lot of teachers who came and spoke tonight, um, and words feel meaningless when uh, there's questions of being able to have a livable wage. Um, however, I want to reiterate to all of our teachers who came to speak tonight, um, you know, even though it feels hollow, how much we value you, how much I hear you, how much we appreciate you. I know it's really hard when there are people who are needlessly demonizing you um, to show up every single day and jump through the hoop 
hoops and deal with the new curriculum and new standards and new testing and new evaluations um, on top of all of the work that you do. And I'm just so grateful for you. And every single person who works in our district deserves a livable wage. And it really shows what you value by how you spend your money. Um, aside from that, I do want to say thank you, Member Perez, for talking about the STEM scopes. This is something I've been increasingly frustrated about. The fact that we're going into our second semester and there are multiple grade bands that don't have the books that they need and haven't had them and the fact that we haven't asked for a refund or demanded it and that due to my continued um, questioning about this, we finally talked to some people at the publishing company and got some fires lit under that, but the excuses that I'm hearing are unacceptable and the fact that we're paying full price for that and we're going to the second semester and almost all of fourth grade and many of third graders didn't have their workbooks or their STEM scopes is unacceptable acceptable um, and we really need to talk about in the contract going forward for any of our textbooks adoptions making sure we have a clear timeline of what that looks like and that there is a clause for a refund in this case because again second semester no books unacceptable um, I also want to say congratulations, Member Perez, for the Equality Florida um, Award. That was amazing. It was an amazing event. So many great people from our community there. Um, I want to say that we went to the Great City Schools Conference, and I thought that was fantastic. I've come back with so many great tips and ideas about specifically supporting students in urban communities from around the country that I'm so excited to share. Um, I do want to say, yes, if you can participate in the Great American Teach-In, please do, because it's a great event. I'm scheduled the entire day, and I always love going in and connecting with kids and telling them about public service and all the reasons they should come aboard and be involved in that. Um, I also want to thank the, thank the superintendent who was able to get the Bucks cheerleaders and Captain Fear out at Thanona Sassa Elementary. Um, you know, they had great advancements, and they got their grade up from a C to an A in one year, and the principal is a gigantic fan of the <laughs> Buccaneers, and the school was so excited to see Captain Fear. The, I've not seen kids that excited and enthused in so long. So thank you for making that happen. Um, and I guess I had less to talk about than I thought I did. So got it in way under the wire. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Hahn. Thank you. I appreciate it, um, Member Combs. Um, uh, one thing um, that I've noticed uh, in regards to the sex ed curriculum opt-out form um, I've had some constituents reach out because they were frustrated that they still couldn't find the form. It took me quite a while because it is at the very, 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 very bottom as bottom could be of our website. Um, it's pretty small, so I don't know if we can you know, move that to a more visible area given that that instruction is happening now. So parents are looking for that form now. Um, it also says uh, it's a science course opt out. And so it's not real specific. So again, my parents, my constituents were, well, where's the sex ed one? Because they saw science, they didn't connect that. So if we could be more explicit that this is the sexual education opt-out form. Um, that would also be helpful. The other thing, I know there's always lots of conversation about being sensitive to the fact that we have a majority of Hispanic families in our district, and yet when I click on the website translation, the website will translate to Spanish. However, the form does not because it's a static photo. So if that could be changed, because I don't know how you can opt out of something that you can't read, I'd really appreciate it within the next 24 hours because, as I said, the instruction's happening now and parents are looking for that form now. Um, okay, uh, another note, I wanna catch up on some things. Um, one, I don't know if Pablo can show the Early Childhood Literacy Fair video. Um, that took place um, two weeks ago, and we had hundreds of families show up on a Saturday morning. Close to 600 families were registered. Um, so, and there's just some photos. Uh, <laughs> yes, I wore the costume. I was ready Freddy. Um, and it was hot after a while. I got dizzy. It was a whole thing. But <laughs> it was fun. Uh, I want to thank our many partners who make this event so special. Uh, we had the Blake Theater and Costume Design students that came out. For, um, they were dressed in story time costumes, as you can see there. The kids found it so incredibly entertaining. Um, and so I want to thank them. Uh, da -da 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 -da. 
Grease Toys. I want to thank um, Heather De Palma, Sean Paris, and Betty Jo Jenks for organizing the students who attended from Blake. Um, it was it was just a lot of fun, and the, like I said, the kids got really excited. I want to thank some of our uh, HCPS employees that were that always come out. Um, Tracy Brown, Debbie Debbie Pepe, very special. Uh, they always come out and and they help out. Uh, Anne Marie Courtney and Sharon O'Connor and Laura Cross could not do it without you. Um, as well as our Hillsborough County ELL, FACE, VPK, Host, Human Resources, and other community partners, the Early Learning Coalition, the Lightning, the Bucks, the Rays, the United Way, Seniors in Service, Tampa Family Health, Children's Board, Glazer Vision, Fiddlers, Child Find, Mayan, and the Bullard Fan Family Foundation, and Hef for all the books they've do donated that continue to make this a success over and over again. The next fair is March 5th at Foster and Sly. Looking forward to another big crowd. Um, uh, and then the same day is a literacy fair, but in the afternoon. And the last day of Hispanic Heritage Month was um, a STEM event that was focused on coding robots. And it was um, the fo the the um, groups of kids came all over from South County. It took place in, in Waimama at um, a church down there and many of our Hispanic young young students from um, surrounding schools attended for free. We gave them breakfast and lunch for the event um, and they had so much fun and they got, I gave away two books and they probably popped up there but uh, one was about women, famous uh, women in STEM who have made, you know, great strides. And the other was um, to celebrate Hispanic History Month. And it was Hispanic women who have done great things around the world. And half the book was, the, the book was all in English. And then the second part of the book was the same book, but all in Spanish. So it had beautiful illustrations. And so that kind of wrapped up ha Hispanic Heritage Month. I want to thank real quick, because um, I know uh, time is short. Uh, I want to thank my sponsors, which was Ed Gems Math and the Women's Conference of Florida. Um, they were phenomenal. Ed Gems really made, has made a commitment to support the development of STEM and literacy throughout our community. And they understand the positive impact that this type of experience can have for students, whether they go on to pursue a STEM field or for any field they pursue, the skills they learn. Um, whether it's team building or problem solving or analytical skills or um, all those are all things that they can carry with them through life. Um, so I couldn't be more thankful for their support. Uh, also a big thank you to Pastor Carlos er Erzeri of Wholesome Community Church in Waimama for providing space and hosting the event. Eric and Dory James uh, Jones, again from Ed Gems, for providing their middle school curriculum, which um, we used to create the um, activities for that day. So there was a real connection between our math middle school curriculum and what the girls were doing that day during the event, which was really cool to see. And Dr. Holmquist Johnson for providing the day long coding activities. She's an expert around STEM and these types of events. And um, to the parents who trusted us with their children for the wonderful event and for that day, they came and watched um, the competition at the end and it was so much fun. And that is it, thank you. Thank you, Member Hahn. Member Gray? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to recognize um, Gary Graham of Durant High School. He's been awarded and recognized as achieving a gold school status from the Hillsborough Healthy Schools. His work and his staff at Durant High School have created a healthy social and emotional school environment. This is supported by the many programs and policies that nurture positive behavior and promote a feeling of belonging and respect for all students, staff, and families. And indeed, uh, Gary, you were uh, and you are a transformational type of principal at Durant. We thank you very much for that wonderful, positive school environment. Uh, I want to also thank um, our great principal, Strawberry Crest uh, Rayburn. Uh, she allowed me to judge <laughs> Halloween doors, but I think what I got out of it most was the amount of work each teacher does uh, to prepare for their class. I mean, some of the teachers taught AP along with, um, oh gosh, two other subject areas of high depth 
very highly skilled faculty, but and a hardworking one at that. Um, Miss Rayburn, wherever you are, you have really collectively um, put forth a such a positive learning environment at uh, Strawberry Crest, and I so much enjoyed it. And uh, I hope that you'll let me know who won the first, second, and third prize. Next. Um, I want to thank the public school advocates for not only their wonderful uh, ride, um, which uh, Member Combs, Member Vaughn, Member Washington, we all had a great time. And uh, and also, probably the most important part, too, is their support for the community schools. Um, and just to remind all those who want to know about community schools, it really involves uh, supporting with transportation, medical care, food pantries, parent parental engagement, internship from universities, and then on and on. It's a great organization. Thank you, public school advocates. Also, I was happy that we all, Superintendent Davis, and uh, I believe it was, uh, I know it was Member Washington, Member Combs, Member Vaughn, myself, um, we truly got a lot out of the Council of Great City Schools, and uh, I know that uh, we at least for myself, I remember getting a lot of the high-needs black uh, students and the high-needs Hispanic students, both male and female, learning about what supports and resources have effectively changed their trajectory as uh, far as education goes and social and emotional needs. Very, very informative, rich convention. Thank you, Kristen Davis, for driving me there and back and supporting uh, me as we uh, collectively engaged in many workshops. So, okay, she gets a few points. Uh, by the way, uh, Ms. Davis usually does drive me to Orlando and back on other occasions, so thank you so much. Well, we go to Central Florida. Uh, 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 Central Florida Education. All work-related. Yes, three. Okay. Uh, also, uh, again, a congratulatory uh, uh, expression of uh, high, um, high, high, just a high-caliber principal, Principal Katie Rocha of Newsom. Um, we're so happy for her to have the uh, the eight. I mean, the um, principal of the year and Angela Brown at Liberty Middle School as the AP principal of, uh, AP, assistant principal of the year. So last also, Member Snively, you will be missed. We, we are just so fortunate and blessed to have your presence for all these years, so thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. And just a couple things. Um, I want to thank you, Superintendent Davis. We had another really successful Latin Education Equity Community Roundtable, um, and you continue to really uh, listen to the Latin community, and we're seeing the numbers increase with the amount of principals going in the um, principal to pipeline. I know Araceli, Melissa Morgado, Marcos Murillo. We have so many great leaders who are in the district, and, and thank you to everybody who's going and continuing to support that. Um, I also wanted to say um, thank you to Hillsborough County Public School Advocates. It was such a great evening there. It's a nonpartisan group, but what's great is they really make sure that they support community schools and they see the need of community and advocating and how that can really move students. Um, I had the pleasure of today and also last week to work with Future Career Academy and be on the business panel at Hillsborough High, Wharton, Bowers Whitley, and Chamberlain. And it's just amazing to see all those seniors out there and to hear just from a group of business individuals talk about how it's so important that they can, the importance of workforce development and that not every child is going to go to college, but if they do decide to go to college, a lot of those businesses offer that support so students can graduate debt free. Um, as I was going through, I just I would be remiss to talk if I didn't talk about going to Chamberlain and meeting uh, Mr. Bartholomew Matthew, who is the culinary teacher there, who taught at, who, who was a student there eight years ago at Chamberlain. And not only did he, I have the best salad ever there, but more importantly, the passion that he had for his students and the passion he had for that program was just so powerful. Um, and it goes along with so many teachers like that. Tomorrow, I have the pleasure to work with um, Miss Lewis at Hillsborough High School. We'll be team teaching. 
teaching the 3DE program, and I'm going to give the students all of the many challenges that we have as school board members, you know, with uniforms, books, and I'm going to wait to hear what the students say. What, you know, they look at the pros, they look at the cons, and then they come up with a, with a recommendation. So I, I'm really curious and excited about that. And finally, um, this coming up Saturday, November 5th, is going to be the Veterans Day Parade in Town and Country, which is an amazing event. I mean, last year I walked the entire thing. Um, I was on a, you know, on a, in a fire with the, some firefighters for a little bit, but most of the time I walk through because it's a great opportunity to see really the people in my community, the people in town and country. So I welcome all of you to come out. It's a wonderful event to honor our veterans and also to really get to know our community. Um, and lastly, um, Member Snively, I, I wish you all the best and thank you for your eight years of service. And please, if you'll close out the meeting for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to start heavy and then I'm going to go light and then I'm going to end heavy. Okay, so the heavy part is, you know, when we see the public comment list come in onto our dais seats, um, uh, you know, we're, we're looking to see some patterns. We're looking to see some things that um, if there are issues. And so tonight, um, what what concerned me, and because I've had a couple of um, other parents contact me, um, are the amount of bullying and harassment complaints that came to for us. And at first I thought when I saw this, this how, how many there were, I thought maybe it's the same issue or the same school. But then you, as you heard, they were from various schools, not just one incident, not just one school. And so I, I've asked um, um, some folks to, to meet with me recently, uh, Ken Hart and and um, um, Monica, where we have a meeting set tomorrow just to talk a little bit about some issues uh, around our discipline and code of conduct um, and making sure that we are, that we have the right practices in place with surrounding that. So I would ask it, moving forward if you could please as a board take a hard look at that code of conduct and the disciplinary action that's being taken and making sure it's appropriate for students and for the school for the safety of students. Um, 5517, 5517.01 is our bullying and harassment policy. So um, please, please, please take a look at that and make sure that it aligns with our code of conduct and disciplinary action. Okay, so that's the heavy part. All right, the light part is um, there are three schools left for CEOs in the schools November 4th. Lopez Elementary in Seffner, Thompson Elementary in Ruskin, and the Nodicessa Elementary School. They do not have CEOs signed up as of this moment. So please, uh, if you know anyone that would be willing to go and volunteer in those schools, um, and you know what, everyone who goes to CEOs in the schools, bring a case of paper for the copy for the copy paper. Bring, please bring some copy paper with you. Bring a ream, bring a case, bring some copy paper to these poor schools. Um, okay, uh, congratulations again to Mrs. Katie Rocha at Newsom High School. She is fantastic principal of the year, well-deserved, and it was fun presenting her with that surprise. Uh, I also want to congratulate Susan Sullivan, who is the principal at Plant City High School. She is the Aspire 2023 Woman of Distinction, and we'll be honoring her tomorrow at a nice luncheon. Okay, and then again, just thank you so much. It's been a wild ride these eight years. It's, it's um, you know, I feel good leaving on my terms and, and welcoming a new person in, and I know that you will welcome her and make her feel right at home um, and get her up to speed as quickly as possible. Um, she's, she'll be a great advocate for children. And um, with that, speaking of children, I'm going to read a little poem um, because I've always felt as a parent that we should be on the, on the teacher's side and the teacher and the parent should be a team. You know, it's team David or team Sarah or team Snively or whatever it is. I always feel that that should be the way it is. It shouldn't be adversary like it has started to evolve into that type of relationship. And that makes me a little sad. So I found this poem called Whose Child Is This? And I'm just going to read it to end the meeting. Whose child is this? I asked one day, seeing a little one out at play. Mine, said the parent with a tender smile, mine to keep a little while, to bathe his hands and comb his hair, to tell him what he is to wear, to prepare him that he may always be, and each day to do the things he should. 
Whose child is this? I asked again. As the door opened and someone came in, mine, said the teacher, with the same tender smile, mine to keep just for a little while, to teach him how to be gentle and kind, to train and direct his dear little mind, to help him live by every rule and get the best he can from school. Whose child is this? I asked once more, just as the little one entered the door. Ours, said the parent and the teacher as they smiled and each took the hand of the little child, ours to love and train together, ours this blessed task forever. Thank you. Thank you so much. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>